Uh, morning, ladies and gentlemen. We'll just start in two minutes past 10, just to give everybody some time to come and also those who are online. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, um, and good afternoon and evening to those of us who are joining online. And um, before we start, just the usual message that uh, the meeting is being recorded and the recording will be posted on YouTube. And um, we will have an action point summary report afterwards. Um, early next week, uh, which will be published. Um, if you would like to take the floor during the course of the meeting, if you could please um, put your hand up either in the Zoom room or you can put your uh, card up if you're in the room and then we'll take note of your name and the chair will call your name. And when the chair calls your name, could you please give your name and um, introduce yourself, um, MAG member of the institution, and then um, you, you can make your intervention. With that, I'll give the floor to the chair to start the meeting. Thank you and good morning. Yesterday, we had a very lively discussion of potential themes for this year based on inputs that we've been received and synthesized by the Secretariat. There was a wide range of inputs collected and discussed, including open discussion on IGF 20, 2023 overarching themes and titles, main themes and issues, opening open discussion on the 18th program structure, including thematic tracks and other program components, Input on the high level leaders track, parliamentary track, youth engagement, capacity development, and more. We also received information from several UN organizations whose work may intersect with the IGF. We closed last night's session with four of these presentations remaining in the queue. And so we'll begin our day with those conduct, concluding the input phase of our work. Yesterday's discussions and presentations were intended to provide important input for your consideration. Now our challenge during the rest of the week is to make decisions and recommendations based on the inputs that we've received, and in particular, selecting the main theme and sub-themes. I want to thank you in advance for your presence here and your constructive deliberations towards reaching consensus on these important topics. So with that, I'll just also note that this meeting is open to observers today, and uh, so keep that in mind and a hearty welcome to any observers that we may have. So the floor is now open to continue our for our missing four uh, presentations from last night. The first one is um, Serene Asefa from UNECA.
Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? I cannot put the video on. So I'll be speaking. Yes, we can hear you. And you'll be able to put on your video in a couple of seconds. They'll just enable it. OK. And just for explanation, the reason why we stop the video is just to as a countermeasure for Zoom bombings, et cetera. So you have to have explicit permission. Um, OK. OK. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sorin Asafa. I'm the coordinator for cybersecurity and internet governance at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. Firstly, I would like to express my gratitude to the IGF Secretariat for providing us a platform for UNECA to share its contribution to the IGF process. UNECA has been actively uh, involved in the internet governance at both global and regional level. At the global level, as you are aware, ECA co-hosted the 17th IGF in collaboration with the IGF Secretariat, UNDESA, the Ethiopian government, under the team Resilient Internet for Shared, Sustainable and Common Future from the 28th November to 2nd of December in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. ECA's contribution including logistic and administrative and also substantive matters for the high level uh, session, including the high level leaders breakfast. I would like to reiterate my congratulation and gratitude to the IGF Secretariat, UNDESA, the MAG, and all stakeholders for their dedication and commitment in making the 17 IGF a success. During the forum, ECA hosted several side events, including the WISA's uh, Regional Review Workshop, Technical Validation Workshop for Cybersecurity for Development in the Fourth Industrial Revolution, uh, the launch of Cybersecurity Model Law Guideline for the African countries. In addition, also support, uh, in addition, also participated and contributed in various sessions, including the WISA's 2023 first open consultation in the AUC and GIZ single digital market, to name the few. As a part of ECA's effort to ensure effective, inclusive, and full participation of African youth in the global IGF, in July 2022, ECA established an African IGF task force and mobilized 80 youth representing the five regions of the continent to be active participants in the 17th IGF. At the regional level, as vice chair of the United Nations Global uh, United Nations Group on Information Society and the chair of with the Regional Commission Group for 2022 to 2023, EC has been leading effort to close digital divide in Africa. EC and the African Union Commission has jointly hosting African Internet Governance Forum for the past 10 years. This forum is geared toward building capacity, fostering dialogue, supporting policy development on various internet governance issues. The goal is to carry the voice and the effort of African continent to the global agenda while ensuring that the benefit of a viable information society are mass to every African. Furthermore, ECA, through its Center of Excellence on Digital ID, Digital Trade, and Digital Economy, has been supporting member states to utilize digitization as a catalyst for inclusive and sustainable growth. The Center of Excellence has been undertaking various initiatives that remove national barriers, including policy, regulation, development across digital skill, research, infrastructure, and entrepreneurship. I would like to provide a brief overview of some of our activity for the past year. In the lead up to the IGF Forum, UNECA collaborated with UNDESA to organize African Regional Workshop for the launch of United Nations e-government survey 2022 report. ECA also has been supporting governments of Ethiopia, Botswana, Nigeria in developing and implementing good digital ID framework. Uh, also launched the first edition of State of Instant and Inclusive Payment System in African Report 2022 in, in collaboration with African NENDA and the World Bank. Established the first African Research Center on Artificial Intelligence in Congo Brazzaville. And finally, EC has been running the Connected African Goals Coding Cup. It is ECA goal to promote a better internet for all, through robust national, regional, and global IGF process. We believe 
This can be achieved through collaboration, partnership with all stakeholders across the sector. Therefore, ECA welcomes the opportunity to collaborate with any stakeholder who share our vision for a secure, inclusive, and sustainable digital future for all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. And uh, I think we have Joyce Chen coming up next, IGF Support Association. Thanks very much, Paul, and good morning to everyone in the room, afternoon and evening to those who are online. Um, I'm Joyce Chen speaking as a member of the IGF Support Association Executive Committee, or the IGF SA, as some of you may know. Um, thank you for the opportunity to give an update on the IGF SA and its activities. Um, you probably know the IGF is funded through voluntary contributions. Um, and what the IGF SA does is it supports the sustainability of the IGF in this regard. As a not-for-profit, the IGF SA complements existing funding sources to the IGF and to the NRIs, uh, and we provide financial support for the IGF Secretariat through contributions to the UN IGF Trust Fund. Since its inception in 2014 to the end of 2022, IGFSA has contributed a total amount of 310,000 US dollars to the UN IGM Trust Fund. And in addition to that, um, 525,000 uh, uh, US dollars, which is over half a million dollars, to the NRIs um, over those years. In 2022, we supported three regional and sub-regional IGFs, 10 national initiatives, and four uh, youth initiatives. We also provide 20,000 US dollars to support accessibility services every year, such as real-time transcription and intersessional calls of the IGF MAG, um, the dynamic coalitions. Uh, we've also funded fellowships for people uh, with disabilities to attend the IGF. The IGFSA held its general, annual General Assembly during uh, IGF Addis Ababa last year. Um, and this year, we conducted the EC elections as two of our EC members um, reached the end of their second three-year mandate. They are Eduardo Santoyo and Marcus Kuma, who is also in the room, um, who was also our IGFSA chair. We are proud to welcome Flavio Wagner and Amado Espinosa as new EC members, and I'm very happy to announce that fellow MAC member, Amrita Chaudhary, I'm not sure if she might be online uh, with us, uh, has been selected as, uh, by the EC as our new chair. For the record, uh, we appreciate and thank Marcus for your efforts in leading the IGFSA all these years, and we'll do our best to continue the good work that you have entrusted with us. We have begun to receive NRI funding requests this year, uh, and of course, we are processing these requests as usual. In the past two years of the pandemic, the EC was aware that there were many changes and struggles among the NRIs, and so we have provided support as much as possible to ensure that events continue to run. This year, with more events going hybrid, um, the EC is also going into discussion and working to make sure that we can meet those funding requests um, from the NRIs. So in closing, to help the IGFSA continue its work and support of the IGF and its processes, I encourage those of you who are keen to join us as a member. Uh, and we also welcome any opportunities to seek funding support, um, noting that the funds we receive go directly to the IGF and NRIs in support of their activities. Thank you. Thank you very much. And next we have Bai Min um, from Andesa. Thank you, Chen. Greetings to MAC members and colleagues joining online and offline. Uh, my name is Waimin Kwok, Senior Governance and Public Administration Officer at UN Desta, at the Division for Public Institutions and Digital Governance. At the division level, we support member states in, in the governmental, research and capacity developments in issues related to digital government, digital transformation, data governance and public institutions in relation to SDG 16 and cutting across other SDGs. As the department, UN DESA is one of the key secretariat bodies supporting the development pillar of the UN and the SDGs at the UN headquarters. Every year, UN DESA convenes the high-level political forum on sustainable development in July, the central platform for review of the 2030 agenda. UN DESA supports ECOSOC as well as several UN commissions and committees. This year, DESA is focused on the milestone event of the United Nations the SDG Summit, to be convened at the level of Head of States at the UN General Assembly in September 2023. This is significant as it marks the midpoint 
review in the implementation of the 2030 agenda for sustainable developments. It goes without saying that the global digital agenda is an integral part of the thematic issues at the SDG summit. UNDESA is also the administrative umbrella facilitating the IGF main grants and the IGF secretariat, supporting its programmatic human resource and financial administration. We also provide direct support to the Secretary General convening role of the IGF. In backstopping IGF, you'll be remiss of me if I don't discuss about the upcoming Resist Plus 20 review by the GA in 2025, which will also be IGF Plus 20 review. As a quarter based Secretary Department, DESA is mandated to provide and coordinate Secretary support services to the GA high level events, including WCS Plus 20. We are, of course, very mindful that the WCS Plus 20 process will be the whole of UN system efforts and will be multilateral and multi stakeholder. And DESA is fully committed to work closely with UN entities, partners, and all stakeholder groups. Uh, it's worthwhile to briefly recall the process of the WSIS Plus 10 in 2015. In 2015, um, through a year-long process, Resolution 70-125 decided that the GA would hold a high-level meeting on the overall review of the implementation of outcomes of WSIS in 2025. Of note, the same resolution also extended the existing mandate of IGF for another 10 years. So the IGF will reach the end of its current mandate in 2025. It's important to recall that this is actually the third mandate of IGF. The first mandate granted through the Tunis agenda was only for five years. And the second five-year mandate was given in 2010, also through a GA resolution. Um, to, to, to recall what was done at the WSIS Plus 10 review, the GA would first consider and adopt a resolution on the modalities. Then the sitting president of the GA will appoint co-facilitators to lead the multi-stakeholder and intergovernmental process. UN DESTA as well as other UN agencies will carry out a series of stock taking, prep meetings, as well as consultation sessions with all stakeholders. There will also be a call for written inputs and submissions. Finally, through a series of informal informers negotiation, then the high level meeting of the GA uh, will adopt the resolution. Um, notably, there are many UN bodies and agencies with highly visible and related work in WSIS and internet governance including ITU, UNESCO, UNTAC, UNTP, and all regional commissions, as we heard earlier and yesterday. So it would definitely be a whole UN whole of system approach in the WCS Plus 20. It is clear that the IGF and IGF community engagement is critical. Uh, we have to be well aware about the connection between the GDC, the Summit of the Future, and the WCS Plus 20 review. I'd like to end off to say that the uh, NDESA, we are ready to speak with you had one UN voice and to engage the MAC, the IGF ecosystem, as well as all partners in the process. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think we have Mary Elza from uh, UNESCO. Thank you, Chair. Um, my name is Maria Oliveira. I'm the uh, director of the division for uh, digital inclusion policies and transformation and the communication and information sector of UNESCO. Uh, which is the uh, side of UNESCO that is tasked and mandated to protect freedom of expression, access to information, privacy, as human rights. Um, and, um, you know, we had a very busy uh, last year. Um, we continue to work under, uh, to advance the principles that our member states have um, identified uh, and proposed for um, endorsed for, for um, development of the uh, uh, digital ecosystems, what we call the Internet Universality Principles, the Rome Principles, the Human Rights Openness, Accessibility, Mode Stakeholder Participation uh, Principles, uh, which counts on a, on a very good dynamic coalition uh, from the IGF as well to be, for its advancement. Um, on the human rights side, uh, the biggest uh, uh, event for us last year was, of course, the Internet for Trust conference. Uh, uh, well, uh, starting the negotiations on that, that culminated on the meeting uh, that uh, the conference that took place um, February this year, you know, a few days ago, as a matter of fact, um, which counted on 4,300 people uh, participating actively, uh, 1,700 physically present and the others online, plus, you know, hundreds, you know, um, tens of thousands are following it, um, uh, the webcasts. 
Um, we had 22 uh, um, side events on the day on day zero, you know, uh, uh, including on topics that have been uh, mentioned here, as well as constituencies that have mentioned been mentioned here. Uh, we organized a side event, for example, with the Internet Parliamentarian Union to discuss uh, the roles of parliaments in uh, regulating uh, um, uh, digital ecosystems uh, to ensure information remains a public good, which was, you know, the, the scope of the conference. We had another one on, on uh, organized uh, with uh, OECD on uh, 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 generative AI, one on on uh, on Rome, and so on and so forth. Um, the conference, of course, was attended, you know, uh, opened uh, with uh, messages from two heads of state, um, Prime Minister of Iceland, as well as as uh, as uh, the President of Brazil. Um, and uh, continued with uh, uh, Nobel Prize winners uh, and major, major uh, um, participants uh, in the digital ecosystem, including uh, from big tech companies, uh, Microsoft, uh, thank you uh, uh, to our chair, um, Microsoft, uh, Google, Amazon, TikTok, uh, Twitter, and you know, um, you, you count them, they were there. Um, the next steps uh, in this uh, in this process uh, during the during the conference actually we had uh, about a thousand comments uh, flow in so that's uh, incorporation of these comments into the next version of uh, the proposed guidelines for regulating uh, internet uh, uh, platforms for information as a public good will be issued um, uh, soon uh, hopefully you know mid March already uh, or close to the end of March. Uh, uh, perhaps, uh, but uh, we'll have a target of completing this process by September. And I say target because um, we are not uh, um, promising that. It, it depends on the consultations, we'll, which will continue to take place until we uh, arrive at a at a at a um, guidelines that satisfy, you know, um, uh, the various stakeholders involved. Um, and um, you know, so that's that's one of the of the elements. Uh, in the openness, uh, we continue to advance uh, the work on open data. Uh, we are about to issue guidelines as well on on uh, on open data, um, particularly you know the sharing uh, transboundary sharing of open data. Uh, we're also uh, working uh, with various UN entities to establish uh, uh, open uh, education resources uh, platforms. Um, as, a, as an outcome of the Transforming Education Summit that took place uh, September last year. Um, on the accessibility uh, part, uh, last year we celebrated the first year of our international decade of indigenous languages with, uh, with which uh, we share, uh, we co-chair uh, with DESA um, and continue to advance uh, multilingualism, particularly in cyberspace. Um, so this year, uh, we intend to continue working to ensure that uh, more than 300 languages uh, um, um, that what we have active on the internet, um, um, that this number increases and hopefully to reach the 7,061 languages that actually exist. Um, and we've been working with uh, stakeholders such as ICANN and, and uh, Mozilla and others, you know, uh, Wikipedia and others to, to expand that. Um, in the mode stakeholder side, um, we issued um, guidance on uh, on uh, development, a uh, multi-stakeholder based development of of um, um, uh, digital transformation policies, particularly artificial intelligence policies, uh, last year. And we're starting to to uh, develop the the tools for training and capacity development of member states on, on that. Um, we also trained um, uh, judges. Uh, and judicial actors and judicial um, uh, judges, uh, public prosecutors and other 4,500 of those of 139 countries on artificial intelligence and the rule of law. Because, you know, uh, uh, yesterday, for example, we had a, a conversation in which uh, it was mentioned that judges really uh, rarely understand uh, uh, these kinds of technologies. So obviously, you know, this, the, we had noticed that as well. And I started to train uh, judges in that. We should have a second cohort this year. Um, and we invite, it's free, and we invite every everyone uh, to participate as well, as long as uh, you're you know, a legal, you know, a, a judicial actor. Um, we also uh, issued, um, as part of uh, the ITU UNESCO Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development, um, we issued a competency framework on AI and digital transformation for civil servants. 
Um, and um, we are continuing to now working on developing the, uh, the self-assessment tools for individuals and institutions in order for them to actually apply this, uh, uh, this self-assessment and identify what gaps in terms of competencies uh, the civil servants themselves and the institutions need in order to guide digital transformation at national level. Um, and, um, you know, so uh, we also, you know, very proud to, to say that uh, some of these uh, um, initiatives actually received, you know, uh, um, awards and accolades, for example, our, you know, MOOC on, on uh, for judges on the AI and the rule of law was selected uh, one of the solutions for peace in the, in the uh, Paris Peace Forum uh, and, uh, you know, other, other uh, um, awards such as that. And just to complete, um, since yesterday was uh, uh, International Women's Day, I'd like to say that we also uh, worked with uh, OECD and uh, the Inter-American Development Bank uh, to produce a publication that was really very interesting. It's called uh, uh, The Impacts of Artificial Intelligence on the Working Lives of Women um, that looks at the different ways in which uh, these technologies affect women uh, as users, as you know, as developers, as, uh, as you know, um, um, in different aspects of their work lives, you know, uh, to, when they are recruited, uh, when they are retired, and so on and so forth. And uh, so I invite everyone uh, to visit our webpage uh, to take a look at, uh, at these materials. They are all available, all downloadable, um, um, and usable for free because all we work, uh, always work on the common, uh, um, common license, you know, um, an open uh, um, license. So thank you very much for that, the opportunity to share. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes the portion of our agenda that revolves around closing out yesterday's inputs. And at this point in time, we can now open the floor for discussion of main themes, et cetera. So would anyone like to take the floor? And before, before that, just I'd appreciate it if people keep their interventions to three minutes or less for now. Nobody wants to go first. Go first. Okay. Discussing the themes. Yeah. Okay. Um, what are the themes? Uh, first of all, any comments on the last session? No. Okay. Yes, we. Thanks, Chair Baltanatris, the observer today. Mm -hmm. We've got three short comments. Mm -hmm. The first is on the Diplo Foundation. They report on the IGF. I found out in Addis that they don't report on sessions of the dynamic coalitions. And the reason they gave me, you're not part of the program. And then I thought, we are delivering the outputs. And we're not part of the program according to the, re the reporting organization. So can we do something about that in 2023? In we'll look into it. Thank I'm you. not too sure what they mean that you're not part of the program, but- Not an we'll, official part of the program. We so. will, yes, we'll, we'll look into it, yes. Thank you. The second is we heard dozens of presentations mm -hmm. and we heard at least seven or eight organizations say we're working on AI. Mm -hmm. And what is the goal for us to hear that? Or is it that perhaps we should start connecting the dots between these organizations and see if they're coherent? Well, that's they... exactly the goal is to hear that, okay, we have these organizations that are working on this. How can we connect with those organizations and how can we use them to enrich the IGF and also enrich their discussion? So it's a two-way street. So that is, the, you, you, you have said it, that's the exact. Thank you. I, I mean, think that that was a question that many had uh, yeah. mm. yesterday. The final one is that everybody has three minutes. And when yes. I presented with the Swedish ambassador for the Global Digital Compact, Everybody who started saying, thank you, ambassador, thank you, that, then the thing was switched off. Yeah. She said, sir, your time is up. So if you tell everybody you only have three minutes, then you'll get to the bare essentials. I got to 2.55. I said, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. We're glad to cooperate with you. So, but that's a matter of just taking five minutes to, to train yourself, and then you're down to three minutes. Yes, uh, we hear you on that. That's also one of those things. Uh, do you want... 
three minutes just to have the headings? Do you want the three minutes to have a little deeper? I mean, I'm also guilty of it when I present um, at times. They told me three minutes, but I find that maybe three minutes is not enough to give a proper overview of the whole. But again, yes, it's a, it's, it's a matter of the feel. Um, and as we go on, yes. And if it's somebody's first time, then that's fine. Um, but as we go on and these become regularized or these people become regularized, then yes, we can become um, stricter and stricter. But yes, we hear you, yeah. Because mm -hmm. I was very much amazed that very important people just got caught out. Got <laughs> <Yeah>. out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's just as a comment, thanks. Okay, mm -hmm. all right, thanks very much, Bob. Yes, Chris. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, good night. Um, Chris Buckridge, MAG member, um, right from CC, I guess, institution. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I kind of just wanted to very briefly um, also uh, highlight what Vout was mentioning. I think, and certainly it's no disparagement to any of the presentations and the, the we heard yesterday or, or this morning, I think there is a lot of important information there. Um, but I do think we may, it may, might be time to revisit the format because we have a lot of these and I'm, I'm not sure it's the most valuable use of, or the most effective use of valuable time on the one day of open consultation to sort of just listen to all of these presentations in a way that doesn't really facilitate making those connections or, or sort of asking questions. Um, so I, I mean, I think some time limits, I think submitting written comments that can then be shared ahead of the meeting and maybe give both MAG members and um, others in the open consultation a, a chance to sort of find any points that they would like to sort of ask a question about or, or sort of connections that they might make would be a perhaps more useful way to approach it. But I, I sort of, this is just advice to the Secretariat because I think it's... No, no, thanks, Chris. I mean, we hear that and we've had some also some private comments and we will look at it and see which is the best way. Um, on, the, on the one hand, it's good to actually hear it and also have some, okay, we didn't have discussion in the meeting, but we had discussion online where there were some connections being made online as well. Um, in the past, we've had um, video presentations, which people could go on the website, especially during the COVID and just listen to each individual one. So there's loads of ways of doing it and we just have to find the most efficient way and as this is the idea we do try you know different combinations until we we get something that is right and also revisit that as well so yeah mm -hmm. and jim is that a hand and also please try to say something different from what the others have said because we understand. Yeah, <laughs> I I will. Thank you, Chang and mm -hmm. Jim Prendergast. Um, to build on what was just said, <laughs> um, do we have an open consultation as part of the June Mag meeting? Yes, we do. So that would be a perfect opportunity to pilot a new format. Sure. Yes, that's um, what. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then, in addition to what Chris suggested, um, there are people who do want to present a lot, and for me trying to absorb all of it is just impossible. So having a written contribution certainly is something that I could go back to and reference, but also if people want to develop and contribute their own videos that run longer than say three minutes, that could also be posted to the IGF website. That's yet another resource, yet another output, uh, yet another deliverable for people to refer to back. That's outside of the annual meeting. It's the intercessional stuff that continues on. Um, when we finish this meeting on Friday, we'll settle on the dates for the next um, open consultation and MAG meeting, and then we'll give them notice. We've tried this as well, but even if you give people three months notice, a month's notice, two weeks notice, yes, but we've understood. And Wyman? And I would like to build on that as well, <laughs> but from a different perspective. Uh, working with the IGF Secretariat, uh, we have been thinking of how to make the open consultation more meaningful, more engaging, especially to those who have been uh, less engaged or never engaged. Uh, and part of which I think one of those things we had, that we heard about the IGF improvement is to better connect to the intergovernmental processes uh, as well as to other decision-making bodies. 
So in, in, in that case, when some of us, we saw the list of uh, interventions, especially uh, from the IGOs, UN and non-UN, uh, we are all pleasantly surprised. Uh, and I believe there's also a difference in terms of written and also presentations uh, on site. Uh, because open consultations, of course, uh, one main audience will be all the MAC members here, but it's also for the larger IGF ecosystem. So, but I, I do support the earlier suggestion, make how to make it more concise because it can be very draining when we have too many presentations and uh, many of, you know, exceed the, the, the specific timeline. So I think we can, we can certainly do a better job, uh, but I just like to underscore that um, the, the discussion here is would not discourage, you know, those who have uh, made the interventions. Thank you. And then we have Jorge and then Maria Leza. Hello, everyone. I hope you hear me okay. Uh, this is uh, Jorge Gancio from the Swiss government. Uh, first, I, I would have a, a small plea, and this is that we tweet uh, on-site and offline and uh, online uh, participants uh, equally as much as possible um, so that we avoid having to, to call for, for the floor. Uh, that's a small plea. The, the second thing is to support what... Uh, Prior, prior speakers have been saying. And thirdly, and this is connected with the idea of uh, really connecting the, the dots, especially in, um, in the UN, uh, I've been quite surprised not to see anyone from the Tech and Boy office uh, participating uh, these days, uh, not even in the leadership panel, apparently, where the Tekken Boy is a uh, ex officio member. So uh, I would like to uh, put this uh, surprise to the record and ask uh, the secretariat or participants uh, whether there are any reasons for this uh, absence, considering uh, the very important role of connecting uh, the, the dots the Tekken Boy office should have. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jorge. I'm sure, I mean, it's because the Tech Envoy is a small office and it's rather busy, but we will um, get back to them and um, let them know. <laughs> Realize up, please. Now, very quickly, thank you. Oh, Maria Oza um, from UNESCO, uh, Director for Digital Inclusion Policies and Transformation. Um, just uh, again to support uh, what other uh, um, speakers have said and to add that in the spirit of consultation, perhaps, you know, uh, um, once we post either a video or a written statement online, that there is some analysis uh, to identify exactly, you know, like which seven agencies have been working on, the, on artificial intelligence or that. So you can have a, a, an actual consolidated view once this discussion starts. And, uh, and, uh, and for the presenters, you know, uh, then on, on the live part that they actually put, you know, the three big asks that they have or opportunities for engagement uh, that they actually have been offering uh, uh, to, the, to the most stakeholder community you know, rather than just, you know, what happened, but say, and here's what you could be engaging with and uh, working with, contributing to. Those are the entry points we have. Those are the three big entry points. And those, that's where we would like to have your, so that your, your inputs, uh, so that it becomes a real consultation rather than just a reporting process, you know, so uh, that's uh, one suggestion. There. Thank you. Uh, no, yes. Um, and this was also mentioned as part of the IDF plus, kind of activities as well that um, we can go into. Uh, and, and of course, um, it does take some pre-planning building. And um, we did have on the website, you know, ways that um, experts and people can connect. And maybe that's an expansion of that. Um, I don't want to give Lewis a heart attack, but uh, it's one of those things that we can put on the to-do list um, for, for, for us to do. Um, I, Joyce, and I hope you're the last one because we really do have to get back to the um, themes. And Justin. Thanks very much, Chengatai. And exactly, we have the same thing in mind. I think we do need to move on. Uh, we do have a full agenda for today and tomorrow. And I'd like to raise a point of 
order for the meetings that because today and tomorrow is meant to be the MAC meeting. Um, I hope we do not treat the next two days as like an open consultation format. So we do give priority to the MAC members to speak on the mic first. Um, and that's just so that we can get through the bulk of our work. So just for some of the new MAC members who may not be aware um, that there is a difference in the way that we regard um, the past day from the next two days. Thanks. And last speaker on this section, Justin. Um, thank you. Yeah, I was just going to suggest I, I, I um, agree with a lot of comments that have been made and, and looking for kind of innovative um, um, ways to program this. Uh, and support that the written contribution, the kind of asynchronous videos post. I think that's good. I also just think this, you know, seems ripe for maybe a virtual meeting before. I, I think that you know the briefings. I'm actually quite interested in and in briefings from across the UN system on this. It's my day job, so um, <laughs> would be very interested in that. But I just think the format of that could be more uh, like a virtual meeting you do outside of the open consult mag meeting. Uh, at some convenient time for everybody. And then the open consultation, since it's only one day, um, is really prioritized for the consultation, dialogue, interaction, and you actually can discuss stuff, not just get briefings. That would be my recommendation. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Justin. So that is closed. And just to start off, if I may, just to start off with the uh, main themes. Um, so um, the host country did. Uh, take all your comments into consideration yesterday. And um, there is some revised, um, we're talking about the main themes now, um, suggestions for the main theme. And I'll just I'd like to ask if we could put up that slide, if it's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, this is just a way to start off um, the discussion. Mm -hmm. So um, it was understood that it's the internet we want was um, quite strong um, support from some corners. I wouldn't say a majority, but we heard a lot of that internet we want. But then the thought is that the internet we want may be a little bit too ambiguous because we also want to, I mean, what is the internet we want? Um, so it's best to maybe focus it a little bit, uh, global and sustainable, security and trust, inclusive and trustworthy, and then the other internet we want for the future for everybody. Uh, um, if you want, I can give you my personal <laughs> view. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, there is inclusive and trustworthy, I think also in, encompasses everything because if you want to be inclusive, it's global. We're talking about one internet. It does encompass the um, fragmentation angle, et cetera. Uh, trustworthy security. Um, it encompasses uh, data protection, you know, all those issues as well. Um, so that's just to start the conversation. <laughs> I don't know if um, do you want to, if the, do you want to say something? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, explanation uh, from the secretariat, and thank you very much for the very uh, lively discussion yesterday. Uh, we, as host country, uh, understood the uh, the proposal from leadership panel uh, was quite uh, 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 catchy and quite good. Uh, at the same time, we thought. Uh, uh, we had uh, uh, had uh, some uh, a, a lot of consultations internally with our stakeholder community, and uh, we wanted to put some direction uh, in the main theme to guide the this year's uh, IGF uh, to more uh, fruitful and uh, to show some direction to to uh, guide uh, all the stakeholders around the world uh, to build up uh, our internet uh, more more something something and we can uh, uh, as you saw yesterday uh, we uh, our proposals included uh, different uh, several different uh, elements and uh, 
uh, actually uh, different stakeholders or different uh, uh, people had the different priorities. So uh, we want to follow the uh, MAG decision, but uh, still we want to see some uh, specific direction uh, in the team. So that, that is why we proposed uh, uh, these uh, 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 options, but uh, still uh, we uh, know uh, this is up to mark, uh, the decision is mark up to mark. So thank you very much for this opportunity and uh, uh, back to Chia. Thank you, I think we have Chia. Uh, um, uh, yes, <laughs> Joche Kroll speaking here, former MAC member uh, for civil society from Germany. Um, thank you, Chenga Chai, for uh, this concise overview on what we discussed yesterday. From my perspective, I can follow the idea that inclusive and trustworthy is uh, including all the other aspects except for the security aspect. I, I would say trustworthy is not the same, uh, same than a safe or secure internet. So I, I would suggest to add inclusive, safe and trustworthy. Uh, but nonetheless, I also uh, think we should respect the options and, and the perspective that was just given by the representative of the host country, uh, taking that in consideration how we can bring both together. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Justin. Um, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I was uh, interested in the conversation yesterday. I thought there was a lot of really good ideas and it was constructive and it gave a lot to think on last night. Um, I, I I agree with this. Um, I think there was a lot of support for this internet we want. I personally would add a the at the end. I know articles are <laughs> yeah, not, not always important, but I do think it just makes more sense if we say the internet we want. Um, but on the, the 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 second side, and to um, you know our Japanese colleagues' point, I think it would be good to kind of describe that a little bit. Um, I, we we kind of get into a problem when we start specifying specific priorities in that. And I think also something missing here was um, there was this really uh, call to ensure that we're empowering stakeholders in all of this. And then there seemed to be a desire to somehow connect this to the GDC discussions. So I tried to put that together and one of my suggestions would be and would offer is the internet we want and then empowering stakeholders in a shared digital future. And I think it captures a lot of what we will do, which is empowering stakeholders, but also towards what end. And that what end is this shared digital future um, that I think includes a lot of these things and also links back to some of the, the broader UN discussions. Thanks. Thank you, Pruna. Thank you, Chair. No, um, my comments about the, the theme would be for like, this is a key year for us to push forward multi-stakeholderism, especially in light of the Summit of the Future and the GDC discussions. There are no decisions yet on the modalities or the relevance of multi-stakeholder participation. And we know the GDC is gonna lead towards a negotiation between member states. So my preference here would be for the last one, for Future for Everyone, because it also talks a little bit um, with the, the GDC kind of like under like, like theme or, or under phrase. And um, for once, I would like for us to not over focus on security because I think it does bring a lot of like discussions on criminal approaches or criminalization of internet users. Um, and that also sent uh, like a message for the workshop submissions. And we do also wanna talk about human rights and not just the security part. So that's it, thank you. Thank you, Chris, and then Joyce. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, I, I kind of want to agree with um, a bit of what, what Bruno said and, and what Justin was saying as well. I think uh, I, I appreciate the the efforts um, that have gone into to, um, making these these evolutions of the suggestions yesterday. And I, I kind of I do understand also the desire to have a bit more of a concrete aim. I, I think the challenge there is, as we heard, I think from Yuta's uh, original comment, once we start listing them, you start getting people, well, adding more and more in. And I think you sort of, if we look back at some of the, the previous overarching themes, we see where that can lead with some quite unwieldy, long 
um, themes. And I think we talked yesterday, and I still very much agree that we need something memorable, concise, that really um, nails it down. I think Bruno is right. If I if I was to sort of think of what is important to really focus on this year, um, it is kind of to say we should focus on what the IGF itself gives us, which is that empowerment for all stakeholders, um, and that this is a particularly important moment for that, because as Bruno says, we're at a point in relation to a number of very significant global efforts where reinforcing the the importance and the value of that multi-stakeholder model um, is so important. Um, so I, I actually quite like Justin's suggestion of the internet we want empowering stakeholders for a shared digital future. My only thought there is it, I, I think stakeholders always strikes me as a bit of a jargon term um, if we look sort of more broadly. I think it should... I'm not quite sure what the, the right alternative would be, but something like empowering all for a shared digital future, Forever. empowering every, yeah. Um, yeah, so I don't think we're there yet, but I think there, there are some um, good possibilities there. So thank you. Grace. Thanks very much. Um, just as a matter of grammar, I think we should be looking at the internet we want, uh, not just internet we want. <laughs> Just as you know, it just rolls easier on the tongue. Um, I did have in mind perhaps the internet we want inclusive and trusted, as opposed to trustworthy or trust. I think trusted was um, one of the words that was used in, in the Japanese um, suggestions as well. So we might want to consider that. But I do take the point from Justin, Bruna, and Chris before. Um, and I think if we use some language around empowering all or empowering everyone for a shared digital future. I'm not opposed to that. I think that's quite a good idea as well. So I think these two variations um, work quite well. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Rahman. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hamteri, my MAG member. Uh, the, the third option uh, is, is resonated with me. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's, it's inclusive. It, it, it has all um, the meaning that we are looking for, but again, the future component and how we're going to move on as we uh, as the whole ecosystem for IGF is, is, is just moving on. There is a digital comeback coming on. So there is there is a lot of need to go to the future, share, share digital future uh, or any any aspect of uh, uh, encompassing the future and the benefits of Internet and the values generated from Internet for the uh, new generations will be will be highly. So I feel that the option four is probably is, is one of the best but need to uh, to tweak a uh, little bit uh, here and there. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have comments? Uh um, I think I'm a bit lost here with regards to what the objective is. Is the objective the internet itself or is the objective the stakeholder or the person? what is our objective when it comes to the internet as opposed to empowering a person? Are we empowering a person or are we really talking about what we want in the internet? Thank you, that's thought provoking. Anyone have a proposal they would like to make? So we have a couple of terms out on the, that have been thrown out. We've We've heard about the insufficiency of the internet we want. We've heard about making sure we have a the in the internet instead of just internet. And we've had a few other questions that Carol just asked, for example. Um, does anyone have thoughts on how to resolve this into something that could be accepted by all as a baseline Oh, 
Yeah, the list, we have the internet we want empowering stakeholders for a shared digital future, the internet we want empowering all for a shared digital future, the internet we want truncated, <laughs> the internet we want inclusive and trusted, the internet we want future for everyone. So there's several commonalities in these proposals. Does anyone want to have a conversation about any of them in particular, pro or con? What needs to be in or needs to be out? I'm sure there are risks. Sorry, I was getting mixed up with my buttons and my flags, <laughs> but thank you. Um, I, I, I mean, one possibility would be to maybe shoot also look at, at some um, flexibility in the structure. So something like empowering stakeholders for the internet we want. Um, so that, I mean, that's just reshuffling language that's already up there, but um, perhaps puts a little bit more emphasis on that empowerment um, issue. I, I mean, and I we discussed a little last night or yesterday. I mean, I, I think there was a, a participant in yesterday's open consultation who made a point um, in the chat about empowerment being um, perhaps in some ways, but potentially a bit of a paternalistic kind of term. So I think we would need to be at least aware of that and, and sort of being a little careful in how we how we frame that. But I, I, I still do think that empowering people to have an active role in governance of the internet and um, in developing this this sort of global resource is is very important and particularly at this moment is very important so thanks thank you Lito. thank you this is Lito. um i like this last this last proposal very much because i agree with uh bruna and other uh participants that have stated that this is a critical year previous to the gdc uh in order for us to make a point on the stakeholder participation, multi-stakeholder participation in defining internet. So, uh, I mean, uh, there will be this uh, GDC um, agreed by states, but we need to make sure that the all voices are heard. So I, I, I like very much empowering stakeholders uh, as this topic, this year's topic, and, uh, and we combine with the internet we want. Leaving that uh, for everyone to think, what is the internet we want? I, I support very much the inclusiveness, the trustworthy or trust uh, and so on and openness and so many other values. But I think that is short and uh, to the point. And uh, as we said, it has some kind of points. Thank you. Thank you, Aldo Roman. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was looking to the second option, uh, just just to make it short and clear. I was thinking of empowering digital future, and in my opinion, probably the what is in in the internet is part of the empowering because it is either content or or uh, infrastructure or security, because this is this is all construct to empower the digital future. So just. For my suggestion is for second option, just to make it clear and memorable that it is possible. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, thank you very much. Um, for me, I, to, I would rather go with empowering stakeholders for the internet we want. Um, because this um, phrase is really very loaded and it actually encompasses some of the issues of security, uh, meaningful connectivity and uh, sustainability and trust. Um, uh, so I think for me, you know, um, uh, that, that is really a very good one. That is um, uh, empowering stake, um, stakeholders on the internet we want. I think this is, is really very powerful. Choice. Um, just to say that there's a hand up online. Marita, go ahead. Thank you, Paul. Um, I think internet we want, um, sorry, I can't use my video. Um, 
internet we want empower for a shared digital future works and even empowering stakeholders for the internet we want or what um, um, I, I think um, just now uh, Chris had shared but if stakeholder word is uh, difficult for people perhaps uh, all could be used empowering all for the internet we want or um, in, in place of stakeholder I think we could work about it in that way. If stakeholder word is an issue, perhaps all could be used. Thank you. Thank you. Chris. Just to say it may have only been my issue, so I'm not sure how, how broad that, that concern about the stakeholder word is. Um, and it might make things a little easier to stick with it. So I'll just, yeah. Yeah, as in I can live with stakeholder, but if stakeholder word is an issue, then perhaps all could be used. Egypt. Thank you, Paul. Um, I, I'm a bit confused. Are, are we trying to empower um, all for the internet or are we, uh, do we want the internet that will empower all? I think that's, uh, so I would tend to go for, uh, the internet we want and i would also agree to take out stakeholders it's um it it doesn't feel it, it doesn't feel like a, a word that everyone would understand I, I think we should go simple for everyone to know what we're talking about so i i would tend to go for the internet we want empowering all for a shared digital future thank you thank you yes sir Yeah, I, I just uh, you and Dessa, um, but I'm actually speaking on behalf of the secretariat. Uh, just to highlight in in terms of um, the question about stakeholders and all, uh, I I heard about the the consideration of the use of the word stakeholders. But if it's the the to think about using all, I would support uh, support like all people rather than just putting it all, uh, because that there's a question of all of what. Um, and I just a, just a quick note about if you are going back to the to the principles, um, as in talking about inclusive or or, or uh, secure, then we have to be complete. Uh, the the complete um, the four principles that has been uh, always repeated in the UN Secretary General has been free, open, inclusive, and safe or secure. So. So it can be can be too 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 much. But if you choose two or three of those, then that means uh, are we saying that the others are not as important? So um, again, I'm actually all supporting the the current discussion. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, okay, um, didn't know if it was a disorder. Um, no, just uh, because I I wanted to support um, the suggestion by Chris because of the small twist, um, instead of discussing the internet, we want, like if we start with empowering someone to do this discussion, we're also being acknowledging of the discrepancies, um, a lot of people that are not able to join this discussion. And this is kind of a good statement from the IGF on behalf of more inclusion, instead of just like um, yet another discussion between um, all everyone that's already part of this debate. So I kind of like the twist um, just because of that, instead of just, yeah, just support. Thank you. Anyone else? Thoughts? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, well, the, apparently the word stakeholder has become confusing, but I've been working in this field now for a couple of years and I've heard so many people talking about the multi-stakeholder community and I, I cannot recall since when stakeholders has become a confusing word. So either we should be talking about the multi-all community or accept that we have agreed upon what a multi-stakeholder community is. But um, yeah, I, I, I was wondering where this confusion all of a sudden has come from. Um, 
and if I may may speak about my preference, I I, I like the one with uh, empowering all stakeholders. Uh, uh, yeah, empowering stakeholders. Uh, um, uh, what was it? Yeah, the top one for the internet we want. Thanks. Just to comment on that, through your question, why it can become an issue is because it's, there can be an argument on who is a stakeholder of a particular element of the the internet or traffic or applications or whatever. Then that I think is is one of the concerns. It may not be an overriding concern, but I think that that is one of the realities that is attached to the stakeholder word over the last couple of years. Go ahead. I just wanted to support what Paul is saying. When, when we talk about a stakeholder, it's a, a subset of people. Um, we misuse it. All people, all people. But if I'm going to be talking about a stakeholder, I'm looking at who affects this, this one, one group of people. All people, it's all people. So I'm just supporting what Paul is saying. Chris. I, I just, since I was the one who originally raised it, I mean, I think just from my personal experience, my concern here was knowing that when I'm talking um, with, so RIPE and CC, when I'm talking with the RIPE community, the operators, the more technical community, I, I'm, I'm very aware that I use the, stakeholder, the word stakeholders an awful lot just because in these kind of settings and in the, a lot of the work I do, we talk about stakeholders all the time. I, it, it, it's not a word that resonates with people outside this this space. I think it, it, people like, have, what, yeah, as as Carol was saying, they're like, "Am I a stakeholder? What What do you mean stakeholders? They're just like, I'm I'm people." Um, so I, I think, I, as I said, it's not definitive one way or the other. I think we absolutely use the term stakeholders, and we use it for important reasons. But if we're looking to go a little broader and beyond the bubble of of IGF enthusiasts. Um, it, it's a word I think we might want to consider being a little bit more careful and deliberate in how we use, as as Carol was saying. Joyce. Thanks. So just Joyce Chen, Mac member. I want to echo Chris and also Carol to say I, I, I do agree. I think in, in this specific case, um, stakeholders might end up kind of excluding people who may not regard themselves as stakeholders of the internet yet. So I'm thinking about people who are disenfranchised, who may not have access to the internet. How do we think about these people? Do we consider them as also stakeholders or not? And I think for people who might be new to the IGF, just simply saying empowering all people for the internet we want is a much more powerful message and, and much easier to relate than to say something like stakeholders, which we use as a technical community in our lingo very much, but we know who we are referring to. So in this case, because this is just an overarching main theme, I, I think it's okay to leave it at a higher level. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Uh, I was going to say, or use the word that Joyce yes, uh, used. Uh, I was going to suggest include people, the word people. So I very much agree empowering all people for the internet we want. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, thank you. Oh, that's uh, my member. Yeah, I would like to also emphasize um, internet we want, empowering all people, um, because it encompasses also um, people who can who do not currently consider them as stakeholders of the internet. And here I'm talking about people who might not currently have access to the internet, but who we would like to see uh, as stakeholders of the internet. Thank you. We seem to be converging a little bit on a little bit of a um, consensus that people is is the word that you'd like to use. Is that a fair statement? Mary Elsa. Just a very quick reminder that the way we use mode stakeholder in this setting in the, in the MAG is to en encompass people and institutions you know, as well as, you know, so you have governments, you have uh, uh, private sector, you have, you know, beyond people. 
you know, so uh, just just to you know, so that we don't we look at it uh, uh, consistently. Let's say. It raises a question as to whether or not people is is too peopley to to use. Yeah, Justin. Um, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. We seem to be converging around this the internet. We want empowering all people. I, I, you know, I don't know which one we're on, but I, I, I would like to encourage that we keep for a shared digital future. I think there needs to be some aspiration on this besides just process. And so the for a shared digital future captures that. Um, I also think the the IGF community is is somewhat uh, needs to be responsive to calls from others that the that the IGF is engaged on like the GDC and WISIS. And, and this I think helps make that connection. And then to the, the comment from um, from Dessa, I agree when we start picking adjectives, I've gone through this many a times on internet issues on what adjectives do you pick and which do not and long debates about what they all mean. Um, and they're all important and there's validity to all of them. But I think if we can narrow it down to something that like is aspirational, which I think a, like a shared digital future, which comes from other places is, it just captures what we're trying to get to. And it's not just procedural, but it's also aspirational and in, in the goal here. Thanks. Sorry, sir, can you just say the whole thing? Yeah, I think it was the the one the the internet we want empowering all people for a shared digital future. I'm Rita. Thank you, uh, Paul. Um, I think recording in progress. Internet for all. Uh, people is good to go with. Um, if we want a bigger title, perhaps we can use for a shared digital future, or we could also leave it as empowering for all people. Um, and people make up organizations. So keeping it as empowering uh, all people or all stakeholders also works. Thank you. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. Uh, Roman Chukov, observer. Uh, I would keep it. I would propose to keep it short. So either uh, empowering the internet we want, or uh, like connected to our shared digital future, something like this. Because it, this is just a motto, and uh, it shouldn't be very, very huge, as per my vision. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, I, I agree with Justin in terms of trying to make it feel inclusive and part of the people. But if we're talking about the internet, are we talking digital already? So therefore empowering all people for shared future, do we need to use digital? That's just my question. That's a good question. I'm sure there are thoughts. Um, thanks. I, I think I suggested that just because that was the that's the term used in our common agenda. So it helps make that connection, which this is trying to do a lot of things, respond to the conversation here at the MAG, also connect to kind of broader discussions, also give an aspiration and all that. So that's where the, the shared digital future came from. I agree, though. I mean, what is a digital future versus just the future? Um, and so I, I don't have strong views if we well, shared future versus shared digital future. Uh, there is there is um, utility in keeping the same references across all the uses, right? So we should be cognizant about what that means. Any thoughts? Oh, choice. Thanks, and sorry for taking up the mic again. Um, I like that the first one is short and sweet. Um, and also, I guess it's easier to print on a banner. Um, but I also like the third one. 
uh, where it keeps a shared digital future. And, and I'd like to make a case for it because when we say empowering all people for the internet we want, we haven't actually qualified what is the kind of internet we want. And I think a shared digital future kind of gives a bit of a description what we might be thinking of. So yes, it's a bit long, but I think it does sort of explain a bit, kind of make a bit of, uh, make some markers or boundaries around what exactly we're looking at. Thanks. Thank you. Chris? I was just gonna say very briefly, is it more inclusive to leave the internet we want a little bit open because, you know, for our and our many different situations, and uh, yet I think at, as the leadership panel said, the internet we want is a bit of a a different thing for different people. But yeah. Let me jump in just to maybe suggest we. Sure. It would be interesting to just go with the second part, maybe empowering all people for a shared digital future instead of like being redundant about the internet we want and then shared digital future. I think like. It, there are nuances in the discussion so if we want something short then just take the second part or then we can twist between the first one and the third one I don't know but like to keep it simpler and um, also being acknowledging that not a lot of us have access to the internet so a digital future is still kind of like this positive approach on what could eventually happen in terms of inclusion and connecting so yeah and Mary also yeah, I mean, going back to to the comment that I had made on the, on who is a stakeholder, one of the things that uh, that uh, um, member states of UNESCO keep telling us uh, um, is that uh, there is uh, there is a concern with growing inequality between countries as well. So the idea of empowering people um, for for the uh, for the future of uh, you know a, a common digital future doesn't quite resolve the issues of uh, of uh, you know the the disparities that exist between countries that have the capacities to develop and lead you know uh, um, on, on technologies and others that don't necessarily have that even if the people are empowered in their countries they still see you know that discrepancy is growing and so on and so forth so i mean one one of the things uh, on civil society you know the potential for them to participate so uh, I, I like the all you know kind of uh, without the qualifying people you know necessarily because uh, you know that that not only encompasses people, but uh, but also takes takes into account, you know, these other elements of uh, of uh, digital, you know, gaps that are growing. Thank you. Corey. Corey, no. Ah, sorry. Sorry, I, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, perfect answers for government. Uh, I think uh, as host country uh, invited permanently to, to the MAC, just to clarify that. Um, yeah, I think that empowering all people for a shared digital future is a catchy uh, motto for uh, this year's IGF. And it links back very well to the first time we used digital in a motto in 2017 when we invited everyone to shape your digital future. And uh, it links back, as Justin said, also to, to the global discussions about the global digital compact. So it, I think it's, it's a good connection. And digital, in the end, uh, everything or all, almost everything digital is based on the internet as a technology. So I, I think uh, that's... That's a very good solution. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yes, thank you. Um, I also like the first and the third. Um, I like the fact that there's the all all people or all 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 people because I think it just makes it more personable uh, for 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 everybody. Maybe the third one is getting a bit lengthy, so would also be uh, uh, happy with with just keeping the the second parts. I think whether it's the internet we want or a shared digital future, I uh, well, I don't have a strong tr strong um, reference there, so either one would be okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, I was thinking about the word shared. Um, I mean, it, it, it is it is well known within, within our community, but when you go out outside the community, maybe a better word, connected or inclusive, or or even a simple word like a better. 
and might uh, might deliver a clear message or more simpler message than uh, shit. Thank you. Young Wunan, MAG member, I would like to support the uh, first or, and the second uh, proposal because when we are talking about the future, it's it's very, uh, I think we are not clear about the future. It looks like it's uh, very, very far in the future. It's like we are planting trees and we're just waiting for something happen after 10 or 20 years. So um, I would like to keep out the, the word future and the, saying that we can do something now and not in the future. Thank you. Thank you, excellent. Maybe one more idea. So if we want to keep the internet, we want. So we just add some one word like cooperation for the internet we want. So so we show that uh, to make this internet to achieve the internet we want, that something should be done. Like why not? It can be cooperation. Good point. Thank you, Elisa. Elisa. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was just also about to remember everyone that um, the leadership panel had proposed the internet we want and we were all very enthusiastic about it. And now we're seeming to step away from that. And um, being mindful of time, I was also wondering maybe um, the, our chair or the secretariat could um, maybe do some wordsmithing um, and well, see if we can have a, a common proposal. Um, so we're not going to be talking about this for two more hours. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> Did you have a, something you wanted to say? I actually think that's a very sensible suggestion that the secretariat and chair have heard the conversations this morning, which of course I have not, and apologies for being late, but I've been in these discussions before, and I think it can be resolved by trusting the secretariat and chair to take what they've heard and perhaps propose the synthesis of uh, a coalescence of the ideas that have been, been heard and get back to the mag list so that we can hopefully just adopt your wise suggestions. Thank you so much. I was thinking we could perhaps have a coffee break for the same purpose. Or tea break. But I want to make sure I cleared out the microphones that were waiting first. So you and you and you. <laughs> and you and you and you. And, okay. Let's uh, go with Chris and go around this way. I'll, I'll be very brief. I mean, I, I put my flag up before thinking we were sort of coalescing a bit around empowering all people for a shared digital future. And to say that I quite like that. I think the, the leadership panel mentioned the internet we want. I don't think they necessarily were, were directing us towards that as a theme. And I don't think we need to sort of remain wedded to that. I think it seemed like a good idea. But if if we can coalesce around another punchy, memorable one, um, that's that's also fine. And I think that empowering all people towards the shared digital future makes sense, but I'll just leave that. Yeah. Hello, Karina Mirarda, Mac member. Um, very simple. I would like to give my support empowering empowering our people for the internet we want. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just a quick suggestion. We seem to be converging around the first one and the second half of the third one. So maybe we can vote on that or like do a doodle after the coffee break and see how the feeling is around. I don't know. I know I know it's additional um work to the time, but maybe it's it's a fair yeah. way of I actually like Adam's idea <laughs> that we discuss it and then we yeah. come back to you. That's much better. Uh, because voting, we don't really want to do that. Go and establish precedent. Mm -hmm. Okay, did everybody who had a mic up get their say? So we're going to take a coffee break for 15 minutes, 20 Let's minutes? 10 minutes and then we'll come 10 back. Minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, and then you'll come back in 15. Uh, and we'll we'll do a little distillation and we'll have a conversation when you all come back. So thank you very much. We're 
adjourn for 15, In 10 minutes. minutes. Okay, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for coming back um, promptly on time. And we'll start the uh, second half of the morning session. Um, okay. Um, so, uh, just before we get any further, co chair, I'd like to uh, make a few remarks about the uh, the process and selection mm. so far. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you uh, very much uh, all, all uh, members uh, for the very uh, active discussion. Uh, so having listened to the uh, discussion and the proposals, uh, I would like to take uh, a little time uh, to check uh, with uh, our community uh, at home uh, and uh, uh, test uh, the uh, water uh, of the atmosphere uh, uh, in our community, uh, if, if they have uh, any preference among those three proposals. And, and I, I think uh, I, uh, I will come back uh, uh, tomorrow morning. Thank you very much. So, and just uh, for a refresher, um, about the three um, options that you just mentioned, Chengatai. Yes. Um, so, the host country coach will be um, uh, just consulting. Um, with the community uh, back in Japan about the um, three options that we had, um, empowering all people for the internet we want, the internet we want empowering all people, and the internet we want empowering all, or just the people for the shared digital future, or for the shared digital now, as was suggested, instead of, because we're always talking about the future, it's time we start talking about now. But, um and again there might be a little bit more word so we'll come back to you tomorrow um at the beginning of the session with a um one proposal uh for you to look at um now we're going to be talking about the sub themes that uh we would want and we do have the um, recommendation that we have um, fewer sub-themes uh, instead of more, fewer rather than more. Um, last year we had five, 
we've had three, uh, which has been um, passed around as a possible number for the sub themes. But of course, um, this is open to discussion. Uh, the host country is also interested in maybe putting one of the uh, proposals um, as a sub theme, you know, like global and sustainable um or security and trust or inclusive and trustworthy or uh, um well I, I don't think the last one for the future for everyone because that is encapsulated in the um main theme uh we will have the um we'll do the same thing with a google doc and show it up there um but we'd just like to remind you of the a uh, sheet that I um, sent around um, with past sub themes. Again, we can repeat the sub themes because we uh, we are not reinventing, um, you know, inventing new sub themes. We can keep sub themes from um, past IDFs, but these are all just for your consideration and all just to feed into the discussion. Adam. Mm. Uh, thank you. Um, so for clarification, sub themes would be the themes we're asking people to respond to with workshop proposals, main sessions, et cetera, et cetera. All this, these are these are the things that guide people on the topics we would like them to consider when they're submitting proposals. That's correct. That is correct. And um the sub theme doesn't have to be a again just saying that the sub theme doesn't have to be a full sentence describing exactly everything that goes underneath it we can have a uh, paragraph beneath it describing what we want in that uh, sub theme but adam okay in that case i i think reducing the number uh, is problematic in that it forces people to it, it makes it more difficult for people to be specific about where they're looking to put their proposal. Mm -hmm. I think we saw last year when we had uh, human rights and access as a as a theme. We they and that ended up with double the number. I think we ended up with that was very significantly mm -hmm. the one that had the most proposals, um, and that made it more difficult to evaluate. It made made it more difficult for the secretariat to put those those proposals in the right thematic box. So I think there's there's actually benefit in having more themes because we can people can be more specific and and sort of when they're thinking about I want my workshop to be under you know a, a broader choice. Um, otherwise, they come to um, am I making sense? They become too too broad. The catch they're, they're sort of going catch all, and it's not as obvious. And then it makes it more difficult for us to evaluate as well. You're making, uh, sorry, you're making perfect sense that um, on the one hand, more sub themes is easier to uh, for people to categorize their workshop in it. I would also like to say that we do not really have to follow the formula that we have done in the past. Uh, we can also think a little bit outside the box. Do we need sub themes? Can we have one sub themes with workshops that are look? Um, I'm sorry, I'm just talking off the top of my head here, but just having you know a call for workshops that have that um, empowering element and um, for all people, and also elements of the digital future or the digital now. I mean, so we do, we are not bound by what has happened before but this is these are just the suggestions that have been made that we should have less sub themes but yeah <laughs> just one more comment and then i'll shut up again um it also means that if we have more sub themes perhaps it makes the agenda easier to design and therefore easier to navigate because you can see um at first glance that that is a theme on this, that is a theme on that, and sort of navigate your way around both looking at it to plan your attendance, but also almost on the day that you can see that, oh, there's a track over there that I'm interested in, rather than it gives a clarity to 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 just designing the agenda, but also using the agenda once it's there. 
but perhaps. No, I mean, others. that's anyway. perfectly uh, good argument. Do we have anybody who thinks in the other side that we should have less sub-themes or an argument for less sub-themes? Just question. Yes, please. Yes, um, thank you very much, um, Chengatai. Now, when when you say less teams, uh, what are you talking about? Are you talking about from like three sub teams, three to five, or because for me, I think the the um, uh, program teams or sub teams most resonate very well with the with the with the main one. So essentially, if we can have three, uh, maximum of five, I think that's be more than enough. Because the 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 more you have, also you know, there's a likelihood that you're going to have more also uh, proposals as well. And you see what happened last year when we had to spend a lot of time to, uh, you know, to go through all of them one by one. So for me, you know, three to five sub teams, I think is more than enough. That would resonate with the, with the, main, with the main team. Don't we want more proposals instead of less? Mm. That's just a question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, Justin, then Bruna. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Cheng Tai. Yeah, I, I just think the 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 fundamental question is are what are the what are the sub themes for? So if we're actually using sub themes to have some discipline about the um, um, program, then it's worth putting in some effort to developing sub themes that then can you know kind of instill that discipline. In that case, you, then you don't just then we wouldn't want to keep so many sub sub themes. That then it just includes everything somewhere because it, it it's loses its utility. So you know, I think that there is some value in 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 a few sub themes. They can be fairly broad, but that restrict what the program is and help us evaluate the proposals come in and 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 have kind of focus. Um, if that's not the goal, if if we're going to take any good proposal, no matter what its content, if it's just good. Um, and we're just creating sub themes broad enough to encapsulate everything, then frankly, I think it seems a little bit of a waste of time to develop sub themes at all. In that case, just have your, your overall arching theme and then just evaluate workshop proposals in general. I understand there's a desire for, you know, categorizing in the program and it helps, you know, organize in some ways. But frankly, if it's not really doing anything and helping us evaluate workshops and all that, I just I do wonder if it's a it's a little bit of a waste of a time. Thanks. No, uh, thank you. Just to respond to that as well. I mean, as far as the scheduling is concerned, yes. Um, at the secretary, we do use the themes for scheduling, and we try not to have too many um, themes going on. Uh, I mean, the same a workshop in the same theme going on in the same time so that people can come to a um, IGF meeting and follow a thematic track, you know, go to those workshops. And also in the past, we've had the themes being the basis of the um, main sessions as well. So we've derived the main sessions from that. Yes, Justin. Yeah, just a, a quick two finger on that. Yeah, it, it doesn't, it, it can be the the push or the pull, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. um, we don't necessarily have to have sub themes to then have that organization, we could agree to the program, and then the secretariat could categorize in some kind of convenient way to help people organize and schedule or something like that. Um, you know, I'm just, the, the point is, are we using the sub themes to create discipline in the program? If so, okay, then then we should look at it that way and and know that some things will get excluded. That's the point. If we're not, then it just doesn't seem like sub themes are really worth you know having a long uh, discussion about because they're not really doing anything. Thanks. Thank you, Shingatai. No, maybe um, also joining the dialogue. I I think we almost always consider the sub-themes as clusters or the tracks, right? So we can look at, look at it as clusters, just like to like bundle it all, up, it all up together and then just like kind of have a more of a more objective way of analyzing the workshops and everything else. But we can also think of it as tracks because it allows you, like if you're somebody, let's say from my part of the community, civil society, working on digital rights, then you know where to go, which are the sessions you need to go or you need to follow or, or how like somehow 
the conversation into a main session is heading towards. Um, but looking at what we did last year, I, I do agree with Adam that like joining, putting together, um, connecting, the, the part about um, connecting people and human rights was a little bit problematic because it, it, it kind of also kind of, um, it, it's two very relevant and two rather competing um, topics, um, especially because we are almost always discussing this. And, and for Africa, the discussion about connecting people, it's way more important um, because it's, it's kind of the baseline. But I, I would like to maybe suggest for this year that we could have maybe a focus on the processes as well. Um, it's something that was somehow discussed in the policy network on fragmentation about the fragmentation of the processes, the, the broader internet governance processes. And, and every day here we have been hearing about WSIS plus 20, GDC and things like that. So maybe we can think about that either as a, a track, an extra track, a high level track or something like that. But let's try to have a focus on the processes as well because it would be relevant to see um, how they could influence the IGF and also thinking about the mandate renewal and so on. So that's it. All right, uh, just a quick question. Processes as processes or processes and the subjects within the processes because the issues within the process seem to me to be basically cross-cutting them, if I, you know what I mean. I don't know. I, I think we had some ideas about like maybe um, try to host a main session about the processes, like something that would focus on WSIS plus 20, IGF mandate renewal, GDC and things like that, and how, how all of these um, processes should like talk to each other, but maybe like having kind of this, this back um, note on all of us to, to think, to consider um, setting forward the conversation about this beyond just the, the the content would be also interesting. So focus on the process too. Thank you. And Chris, you're up. And, okay. Thank you, Peace Oliver Muge, uh, Mark, uh, Mark member. So I think to just add on what everyone else has said, about uh, having these themes. I think it's very important because one, imagine a situation where we have uh, people uh, submitting proposals for just a few particular topics and others are left out. I think it also guides the kind of uh, uh, proposals that we receive and the kind of conversations we end up having uh, during, the, uh, during the forum. So I think it's very important to have. However, I don't know, Chengetai, what you mean having fewer are you talking about like less than five or four that we've always had? But I think it's so important to have these things. Thank you. Um, uh, I was just um, retelling what I've heard about, you know, having more, I suppose it goes underneath having a more focused program, so having less themes. But then there's been other ideas that have been put in having no themes and then we receive the workshops and then it's up to the secretary to see what the workshops are and it, that is a heavy load on the you know the, on the back end as well and then those are organized into some tracks based on the inputs that's received or have it upfront with the themes but from what i'm hearing i mean we haven't heard everybody but from what I'm hearing from what Adam has started is that it's better to have a more structured program. I mean, we I mean, what we want is something that's easily navigatable, easily uh, so that when people come, when people submit and when people come to the meeting, they can also follow um, quite easily. And so there's two ways of doing it, doing it upfront where we have more detailed um, buckets where people can put in their workshop proposals or have it at the back end where there is a um, streamlining process by the secretariat, which I think Eleanor over there will be, you know, tearing her hair out doing, but yes, I mean, those are the two things that we can do. Um, I hope that makes it clear. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. Chris. I'll jump in quickly, but I'm just noting Amrita also has a hand up in the chat. Um, just, I, I, I wanted to flip it a little because in talking about the purpose of themes, these sub themes, um, what I haven't heard much, I don't think um, from people and what I would see as actually based on last year's experience, the most important role for these themes 
is helping us with outputs and helping us with structuring the messages. And I think if we're looking, if we're listening to what the leadership panel is telling us about the, the need for crisp, concise, targeted messages for when they're engaging and they're doing their ambassadorial role, um, I think if we have a, a relatively um, a long list, historically speaking, of, um, of sub-themes, that lets people sort of be quite targeted in what they're doing, but it also lets us sort of have shorter, more sort of granular messages that come out and that we can develop um, during the event, leading up to the event, and certainly um, at the end of the event. Um, and that gives us something to work with going forward. And I think particularly if we're looking at the, the GDC, and I think it makes, I, I'd certainly think it makes sense to sort of keep with the themes that we had last year with some modulation of that, like breaking up um, uh, connecting people and safeguarding human rights, like adding something in relation to digital cooperation um, processes. Um, but but yeah, then allowing those to be distinct areas which can each have their own um, concise messages attached uh, when we get to the end of this process. Great, thanks. And Rita? Thank you, Paul. Um, so I agree with what Chris uh, Peace mentioned earlier uh, and some things of what Chris mentioned. I think uh, the themes give direction even to the proposers uh, to think on, uh, not everyone has, uh, you know, can uh, kind of visualize and put their thoughts into broader ideas, but if we can specify, you know, what we are meaning by the sub-themes, it helps people also to, uh, you know, kind of think in their mind and then make submissions because not everyone has the same level of understanding and we want new people to come in to make their submissions. Uh, I think what I heard as comments more, uh, and I may be wrong, is we had too many sessions uh, the concern was not over the sub themes, but it was more over about too many sessions which we had, which were overlapping. Um, so perhaps to give direction to people, we need to have certain sub themes so that people can precisely uh, make their workshop submissions in that manner and not go all over the place. And it also helps us to evaluate um, as MAG members and for the secretariat also to bucket them into you know where they fall. Thank you. Thank you, um, Murray. Yes, thank you. Um, um, I was actually going to go a little bit along the lines of, the, of what Chris had said. So my inclination uh, would be rather to go towards more focused approach and it's exactly with the view of the potential outputs. And I'm also, I'm representing the business uh, community or private sector. And it's often very difficult to explain uh, to our members, for example, what does the IGF stand for or why why should you come and join or why should you submit a session because simply the the, the there's just so many topics and and so you don't really have to feel of what is the focus of 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 the program. And so that's a little bit um, why I would be uh, going towards the more focused approach. Now, having said that, of course, I fully appreciate that there's a wide community and and there's a whole the, Part of the purpose is to reflect the bottom up any concerns that are there so there should be room for uh different types of proposals but yeah um i i think as as, as we said that we just need to define the approach um also the practical considerations if it's the programming or, or evaluation okay that's a valid point but but uh yeah we should probably will have to then find a balance between these different actor um, factors and besides thanks Yes, uh, sorry, just to put my own, uh, to underline what Chris has said as well, that um, part of our efforts is to strengthen the idea of outputs. And yes, when we, if we are, if one of our main goals is to strengthen the idea of outputs, then yes, we have to really think about um, how we structure the inputs to, to get those outputs. So yes. Um, yeah, um, uh, thank you. I think the, the overall story for, for the IGF conference from, from the, the beginning to the end should be, should be super clear. Uh, so for, as, as, as we seen this morning, we almost the internet we want is, is probably the theme uh, on, 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 on the IGF conference. So the, the sub theme should, should lead a message in that. So I, I can imagine immediately that 
um, a track will be on on a trustworthy. Then a track will be on 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 uh, on the safe and all these activity that lead to the internet that we want. So we have internet that we, that we want, and we are able to identify three to five key themes, and that themes is connected to the messages that we going to come at the end. Uh, I think that will 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 make it very clear story that everybody should should go through it and uh, they want to attend the conference. Okay. Thank you, Adam. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I I put some comments I have about what I'd I'd like to see as the themes in the the Zoom chat, but I think there's something there that we also are looking at coherence across the whole agenda, so that we have high level tracks which the host country and the and the secretariat will will develop but they should also we hope be along similar themes so that we know that all discussions in the igf will be somewhat focused on on similar topics and the same for parliamentary tracks um i completely agree with the with bruna's suggestion that we we also think about um the broader governance issues so not a track, but a session that, are, or perhaps a track, um, but definitely a session discussing WISIS plus 20, GDC, uh, other governance issues, so that the community can address those types of topics. I think that should be happening in plenary. I think it's what the IGF is essentially about. Um, Chris's point, we, we, we discussed a bit with the leadership panel, um, how do we develop messages? And it's not some, <coughs> excuse me, it's always been a tension for the IGF to think about outcomes um, since its very beginning. Um, so thinking about outcomes is, is a newish thing for us. So trying to think as we design the program, what do we want out of it? We might even use it as a sort of preparatory process so that we're thinking about how our message will evolve from now as we begin considering the agenda, where are we by July and the meeting there? Where are we thinking in terms of what an outcome might be? So we're almost preparing a message um, that would be not in draft form. I'm not suggesting we go with a draft document, but drafts in our collective sort of minds so that we know that at the end of the IGF, we're not just suddenly reacting to what was said, but we're preparing for possible outcomes. Um, and I think more structured to the... Uh, to the to the themes would help us do that. Um, I'll I'll I have to leave early, so I'll send a message to the mag list with some thoughts. But um, yeah, also worth thinking about some of that. Henriette's email this morning, particularly where she talks about preparatory processes, how we can use that. Although noting that this IGF is rather new, so we have a lot to do. So um, don't take on too much, but let's try and improve and do a bit more. Thanks. Carol. I just want to um, agree with regards to making sure that any track or themes that we come up to, um, we go back to the internet we want. Um, so we might not be able to say, okay, it's only three, it's only four or only five, because we might miss out on something that's key to the internet we want. Um, I think we probably need to throw out some themes and whittle it down. I don't know. Thank you. Uh, Jorge. Thank you, Paul. Uh, just uh, very briefly, um, Jorge Gancio, Swiss government. Um, regarding the themes, uh, uh, turning back to what we discussed yesterday and in other occasions, I think it would be important that we use the same themes for all the tracks, for the ministerial, for the high level, for the workshops, for the open fora, that we are consistent because otherwise it's very difficult to, to navigate if each of these tracks has different sub-themes. So again, this idea of an FIP, a fully integrated program, this means that we use the, the same themes and the same sub themes for for all parts of the of the program. Uh, another thing is that I, I feel we should use the and we should build on the messages of uh, last year. So uh, they should be like the first input for the different tracks and for the different themes. They should be considered when organizing 
the when preparing the workshops, the other kinds of sessions, and when preparing the main sessions, so that we really build on the knowledge, on the consensus and the ideas we already had the, the previous year, so that we ourselves use our messages for uh, improving and uh, incrementally developing our thinking. And um, I also very much agree with, uh, with the idea of uh, having a sort of a segment or a semi-track or at least some main sessions on the process aspects so that we have a discussion on how the different processes on the way interact and interlink. And finally, uh, as Chris pointed out uh, a while ago, I think that the, the tracks and the, the themes that we used last year, um, which are based uh, to a certain extent in the Global Digital Compact, are still very useful, still very timely and relevant. So I, I don't think we should reinvent the wheel in, in that respect. Thank you. Thank you. And that actually begs the question of what should we do with last year's tracks and last year's themes? And is there anyone in the in the room who feels absolutely strongly that we must use at least some portion of the same theme from last year? Um, getting getting down to the idea of continuity between what's happening this year and what happened last year and not trying to reinvent the wheel. So I'm curious as to what the temperature of the room is around reuse and, and uh, I'll take it from there, I see I've got some hands, Justin. And thank you, Paul. Um, yeah, I, I think that, that a lot of the themes probably will carry over and it, it makes sense to just build on what we did last year and not spend, um, you know, a lot of times uh, going back the same way, they kind of maybe just get a, a different way of saying the same thing. Um, you know, just looking at from last year, I think that clearly there was a de desire for some kind of security discussions. I think that was the number one topic. I, I like the way that we approached it last year, which was safety, secure, and accountability, which I think captures more than just a narrow cybersecurity angle, but like a lot of the conversations that folks are having around safety and security issues. Same thing with uh, artificial intelligence. That's a, a, a big uh, priority for many folks, rightfully so. I think the way we approached that last year made a lot of sense. So it was inclusive of other uh, advanced technologies, but you know, you specify AI as a topic that folks really want to talk about. And then, um, frankly, I think that the connecting all people and safeguarding human rights, even though even last year I thought it was um, strange that those were linked together. Um, you know, they, they, they can often take very different dimensions, even though, I mean, everything's connected, but they take very different dimensions. The one thing I was just going to say is it, on connecting all people, I think that kind of goes back to the overall theme. So keeping that connectivity and, and all that is important. I, I do think that even last year, we were a little bit missing this idea of digital inclusion, which is not just connecting, but it's also empowering, which again, goes back to the, uh, the overall theme, empowering all people. So I, I would want to keep that one as well, but I think maybe um, tweaking with that a little bit and updating that, you know, the conversation has kind of moved to connectivity and digital inclusion, you know, empowering, not just connectivity. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, sorry to interject again. Um, so we do, we are displaying the uh, last year's themes, and I think we can use that as a basis for the discussion whether or not we want to modify etc um, one thing I do see that is missing is sustainability which I don't see it specifically mentioned but that's just an idea mm. Adam. yeah I put some amended I'm sorry I'm talking a lot but I promise I'm leaving around too so you won't have to bother with me for another after that um, so until then Apologies, I'll speak again. I put some text in the in the chat with some ideas of tweaking um, those themes from last year. 
I do think they're useful to continue. Um, so meaning, and it goes to some of what Justin said, meaningful access and the global digital divide, noting that the leadership panel, when we discussed with them, had comments about how divides exist across all societies. And that was one of the highlights of the pandemic, that we see divides and inequalities highlighted very strongly. But of course, the emphasis should be in remaining on the global south. Um, so you'd have an access component, safeguarding human rights, which was the most popular theme from 2022, I think, um, when, as we noted, access and human rights were the same topic, so splitting that out, um, avoiding internet fragmentation, and I'll comment on that in a moment, uh, governing data and uh, data and protecting privacy, security and safety online, because as Justin noted, they were highlighted as sort of being merged in another topic. So drawing that out and then addressing artificial intelligence, including advanced technologies, which, uh, yeah, is, is that way around. Um, the point about, so I can either stop there or I can explain one bit, which is the uh, Global Digital Compact have changed their themes somewhat. Um, they've changed them mid-consultation, which is a little bit odd, adding um, internet governance in place of internet fragmentation. Um, I think it would be odd for the Internet Governance Forum to have a theme internet governance, um, because that's what we do. Um, and they were unable to explain when the leadership panel and MAG asked them what did they mean by internet governance. So that suggests it will be very difficult for us to explain to the community what we're seeking as input on those topics. Um, and also we, they have that added a, a topic about, um, is it go global public digital goods or digital commons. Again, when we asked them to explain what they meant by that, they were unable to do so, which means it's going to be very difficult for us to explain what we're anticipating people to suggest topics on. And we do have to have a description of what we're anticipating. Otherwise, it could be all over the place. So that would be one reason for keeping fragmentation over governance and one reason for not including uh, the global digital commons uh, topic. Um, so that's what I'm suggesting. Thank you. One question, is it the job of the uh, co facilitators to explain or tech and voice office since they're running the process? Just a question. I, I don't know, but if somebody is the leading a process and they weren't able to explain what it was that they meant, it's a bit of a problem, isn't it? I don't mean, you know, it, it may not be their job to do it, but they didn't have an answer uh, and we have to have an answer right we have to be if we have a theme we have to have, be able to describe in a paragraph or so what we're anticipating people to talk about in that theme and if we can't do that then which i don't think we can that's really difficult and i do find it strange that we'd have as the igf having a g topic you know internet governance forum okay. talking about governance is kind of repetitive isn't it thank you Carol. Okay. All right. It's just um Yeah. So um I fully agree on the meaningful access and keeping keeping the global digital divide on the list. I would be inclined to maybe merge the data, the privacy data and safety security under the trusted internet or trustworthy internet or around the trust issue, because I think that. That would maybe streamline a little bit uh, the priorities. And then I do agree, um, and we also saw yesterday that artificial intelligence is still a hot topic or advanced technology as, as you want. Um, so that would be important. I do also think that somehow it would be good to involve the, the, the process aspects, maybe not as a, as a kind of specific theme, but as a cross-cutting element. I don't know how we would be able to introduce that, but um, that would be uh, natural also to do. Thanks. If the recommendation was to have a main session about the processes, yes, we can do that. And that doesn't have to be included here, but if we want workshops about it, then yes, we have to include it. But having a main session is easy, but that's another discussion. It's not this discussion. Yeah. Justin. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, just to build on this um, kind of about aligning to the Global Digital Compact, I think it's it's a worthwhile consideration, but I, we're certainly not beholden to what a New York process has, has described in its roadmap as topic it wants to discuss. 
as I understand that roadmap, those are issues that the co-facilitators have understood that there might be a desire for a deeper dive on. That's it. And I think we did hear from the co-facilitators that they're keeping a very open mind about what will ultimately be on a global digital compact, which might not be based on our common agenda or the deep dives. And so I think, you know, the the IGF and the MAG, since it's our responsibility, should should look to that and keep that in mind, but also uh, describe an agenda that we think is is what's appropriate. I think to the degree we can align it and, and build, that is very, you know, increase that synergy, that's good. Um, but I certainly agree. I, I don't know why it went from internet fragmentation to internet governance. I don't think we as, as the IGF need to kind of make that change or, or you know, kind of follow that lead. Um, and then this notion of a, of a, a digital commons or global public goods or whatever, I, I would welcome, you know, somebody from the UN Secretariat that drafted those reports to come to the IGF in Kyoto and, and explain the, the rationale behind that and the thinking. But again, this isn't coming from the community. I haven't heard a, a big, you know, cry that we want to have that conversation. So I don't think that, you know, we need to align a, a lot of effort in the IGF to doing something that is being proposed for others that no one really understands uh, what it means. Um, so I say all that, I, I, I think that, you know, keeping it somewhat aligned, but, you know, making it our own is, is very valuable here. I do a little bit worry. I, so completely agree with separating out, you know, connectivity access, digital inclusion issues from human rights. They're, they should be separated. They're, they're, they're different and deserve their own considerations, even though there's overlap. I do worry a little bit that we're just proliferating sub-themes uh, and we start to get, you know, kind of an unwieldy list. So it's never popular, but are there things this year that we discussed last year that just don't, you know, shouldn't be continued? <laughs> um, not because they're unimportant, just because we do have a responsibility to prioritize and have some clarity and discipline in our in our program. Thanks. Thank you. And Bruno. Thank you, Chair. Um, oh, sorry. No, just about the processes. I think um, the suggestion can be taken both ways, um, either a main session and one of the suggestions for the main session or this, I don't know, subtract or cross-cutting um, approach to the topic would be this idea around like enhancing multi-stakeholder governance and, and do a discussion about the future of the IGF, which is supposed to any in the GDC. So this space where we could indeed connect these discussions that don't seem to be connected and they seem to be leveraging from being um, held in much different spaces with less participation and so on. So I see maybe a benefit for pushing for it as a track because it would allow for us to have like proper discussions on this. It's not like that we don't have it. Like last year, we had a lot of discussions about the the U.S. process on 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 um, the declaration, and and I, I do think that in some of the fragmentation discussions, some of these these debates were also present. But it will be interesting to kind of have a kind of a guideline about the process on the the sub themes for this year. Um, a second point I wanted to raise is is about I, I like Adam's suggestions about the the divides because. Um, it also allows us to have a proper place to discuss the gender, um, all gender related issues. I do agree that we should maybe have, and we have been talking for two, like at least two months now of having a more um, transversal approach to gender and then how can we um, bring this into our agenda, but um, so far it's not yet present. But I do like the, the digital divide or the divides debate because it's a place other than just the human rights um, where we could discuss um, the gender divide and, and how to include women and also the, the nuances about access and, and empowerment online for us. So um, yeah, that's it, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Paul, thanks everyone. Um, I, so I, I think we're moving in the right direction here. I think, um, again, I'm sort of still coming at it from the sort of outputs, um, perspective and I think in that sense I'm probably disagreeing a little with Justin in terms of I don't I don't see it too much of a problem with proliferation because I think it allows us to create some more granular precise messages um I also don't quite agree with Adam in terms of having um it, it not making sense to have a, a governance theme in an internet governance forum I I do I'm not sure it should replace the internet fragmentation one 
Um, but I do think there are a, enough efforts and attempts at governance going on right now. We've mentioned the declaration, there's there's EU principles, there's all sorts of, uh, not to mention the GDC and the WISIS plus 20. Um, I, I think it, it's useful to have a, a track or a, certainly, let's say, it's useful to come out with messages at the end um, that talk a bit about that or that look at sort of what, what can a multi-stakeholder venue like the IGF offer to those ongoing efforts that are clearly happening in lots of different places to come up with new governance structures or processes or, or sort of declarations, et cetera. Um, I'm a little wary, Chengatai, when you say um, we can just have a main session and it's easy to have main sessions because I, I think... It's... No, 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 sorry. I, I, but the, the, sorry, the point... The point that makes me nervous is I, I, it doesn't seem to me that easy to sort of shuffle around main sessions. I think we we last week last year sort of had some um, challenges in fitting in all of the main sessions and um, covering everything we needed to providing sort of main sessions to the intersessional activities that, that needed them, as well as to the themes that we had, as well as accommodating the high level tracks, etc. So I think I yeah, it, I can certainly see maybe it just a, a main session on those governance digital cooperation issues might make sense but um yeah i think we also need to think about it. are we do we quickly run out of space in terms of a main session um slots that we have um i think that's all i had for now <laughs> thanks okay. and justin sorry i didn't realize this next about others <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I just a, a little feedback. I'm, so, I mean, I'm flexible on the the number of uh, sub themes. I think it just should be part of our consideration of, you know, what why are we agreeing to sub themes? Do they have any kind of role? And and if there's too many, then then they just don't have any impact because it's just you're just finding a way to include everything under some header. Um, but 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 on the feedback on on what's up on the screen, um, I so I like meaningful access. I also like connecting all people. Uh, I thought that also captured the, the thought, you know, connecting all, I, I was thinking connecting and empowering all people, which seems to bring in the digital inclusion. I will just note that if we include digital divide language, which which I think there's an appropriate way to do that, it's not, there is multiple digital divides and it's not just a global digital divide. So I would plural, you know, keep that plural and, um, you know, have it and digital divides because there's many. Um, and then, you know, one thought was, I think that we're trying to find a way to maybe bring in some of these broader conversations on governance or other norms, principles, kind of things. I wonder if there's a way to broaden the avoiding internet fragmentation to having something like str strengthening digital cooperation and avoiding internet fragmentation, which, you know, isn't just, these seem to be kind of similar things. Then you want to increase the cooperation to avoid the fragmentation. Um, and so maybe that's a way that you could broaden it a bit to include GDC, WISIS, some of these other uh, conversations are happening. And then finally, I, I do, um, I, I think there's probably a way that we can merge the safety, security, and protecting privacy into um a a you know one one theme but thanks thank you anyone else have comments <clears throat> joyce joyce chen mac member um i think part of the exercise that we're doing here is trying not to be too prescriptive um, of what we think organizers might want to put proposals forward. That's the first thing. The second thing is the sub-themes are also meant to inspire people. Um, so we don't want to encourage them to always submit the same proposals every single year without advancing the conversation, right? Um, and so, for example, something like strengthening digital cooperation and avoiding internet fragmentation, et cetera, I find it to be a bit prescriptive um, and perhaps pigeonholing a little bit. Maybe we can just leave it a bit broader and let people bounce ideas off it, something like future of the internet and its governance. 
um, and, and let people define how they would like to take it and you know, propose sessions under that. Um, I'm also fine with uh, taking meaningful access or, or universal, universal access, however you want to see it, as a separate pillar from safeguarding human rights. I think that makes a lot of sense because the two are actually not very well combined together. I think safeguarding human rights is, is really about rights and freedoms, you know, internet shutdowns, etc. So that might be good to just have it as a standalone. Um, I think data governance and privacy is one subset of much larger issues. So although, you know, it's a very popular subject, but then what we end up with is a lot of proposals that talk about very similar issues in that theme. So I, I think it does make sense to try and see if we could fold data governance into you know, either some form of human rights or digital rights, or perhaps move it with security and safety. But just mindful that in previous years, when we did that, when we did privacy and security, it, it ended up with a lot of proposals as well. So I'm not sure how, how that might work, but we might want to rethink it so we can streamline, cut down on, on some of the sub-themes that we already have. The last one I think is on addressing um, emerging technologies. I think, I don't know if advanced technologies is the right phrase, perhaps something like innovation and emerging technologies. Um, and then let people talk about AI or you know, whatever that is coming up um, that, that is new or, or in the now. Thanks. Thank you. Have anyone else? Uh, Adol Rahman. Yeah, uh, Rahman, uh, just uh, I was thinking about about a suggestion that we for the themes that if we agree that the output will drive the themes, then probably this is the vertical themes that we we will have. And I can see there is also a horizontal themes. Uh, for example, the ministerial meetings uh, should should be placed yani, within that. Uh, the, the, the sub theme so it enhance uh, the messaging of, of, of that. So probably if we talk about trustworthy, then probably a ministerial meeting on trustworthy might be pulling that one, make it probably easier to, to deliver uh, the output on, on based on that. Uh, the second comment from, from the content perspective uh, is, is that from collaboration, as, as we heard, uh, I think there is there is ongoing discussion about digital diplomacy, and there is a lot of uh, discussions about uh, cyber diplomacy, digital asset diplomacy, and it's all about collaboration, uh, global collaboration, and, and the common things between this one is, is, is the internet itself. And I'm, I'm wondering if, if, if it might uh, emerge as, 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 uh, as a topic to discuss or, or ask proposal on it. Uh, and, and, and the upcoming uh, IGF conference. Thank you. Thank you. And Bart? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Bart Tonatus, Observer. The, the, so thank you for giving me a few minutes. I'm just noticing something. We're talking about sub-themes, but also already putting our eye on what the outcome should be. And bring into mind again, the feedback from the Dutch national IGF about the tracks at, at Eurodig and at the IGF, that they were often totally unrelated, sometimes incoherent, something nothing to do with the track and others were very good. So what Eurodig is doing for the first time, and Sandra Hoferich is not here, but I'm involved in organizing it a little bit, that they have three tracks this year. and before the selected proposals start, they put all organizers in the room together to create coherence so that there's not the same presenter in three different sessions telling the same thing so that they understand they're working toward a message. And that way they understand they are part of a track. And when it's just loose proposals, then people don't have the feeling that they're part of a whole. So that is something that perhaps the IGF could organize. And let me give that as a suggestion that you bring the people together in the track and say, okay, what is it exactly that you're going to do with the mind on messages as well? Because that's the other half we're discussing. Thank you. Thank you. And Bruna, then Justin. 
Just a small uh, quick suggestion uh, following up on Joyce's intervention. Chengatai mentioned at the very beginning that we missed the sustainability talk. So maybe we can integrate that into the advancing technology and sustainability. I don't know if it's the right wording or something like if it's that's the correct suggestion, but maybe it's the place to have kind of a discussion on the impact of these technologies and the sustainability debates. And, and I do think it's a somehow relevant topic for us to, to have on the, the sub themes. That's it. Thank you, Justin. And then. Um, thank you. Yes, yeah, and, and appreciate coming back in on this. Um, you know, I made a comment earlier that, that we're not beholden to the, the GDC, you know, roadmap, and, and I still hold to that. I do, I do just want to suggest that if we're considering topics that are basically the same thing, um, I think we should ask ourselves why we wouldn't try to align those. So there is some coherence between conversations that are happening in New York on topics through deep dives, through written contributions, and conversations that we're having at the IGF in the, in the multi uh, stakeholder setting. So for some of these, you know, I, I might could quibble with the exact wording, but if if in New York they're talking about human rights online, could it, are, are we so opposed to that that it wouldn't be something that we could just agree as a sub theme here instead of coming up our own terminology? They use digital trust and security. Is ours so much better that we insist? I I just throw it out there. I'm I'm hope I'm I'm happy to edit. I just, you know, I think there is some desire to connect our work with conversations that are happening elsewhere um, so we can have impact there. Um, on that, I, I, I don't like kind of the internet fragmentation or internet governance. I think they're both kind of, um, you know, kind of uh, problematic in, in having that discussion in certain places. I do like what Joy said, though. I think that we have this theme of the future of the internet, the internet we want. And, and maybe we could have a, a topic that is broad enough to have, you know, innovative ideas, new ideas. It can talk about governance, certainly, but it is also just kind of open to uh, proposals that kind of are aspirational in the direction, the future, the now, uh, whatever we want to have it. But it does tie it back to that, that overarching theme. And then it also allows a space that has the internet fragmentation or the internet governance or some of the other conversations um, digital future for all uh, conversations that, that people want to have. Thank you. Thank you. And Adam? Yeah, just a quick comment on, um, on uh, where are we, future of the internet and its governance. Is it time to move away from internet and say digital? Um, we've, we've been using on and off the internet since 2005 or something like that. Is it clearer to say things about digital rather than internet, which um, yeah, it, 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 we are talking about digital. We're talking about usage mainly. We're talking about content and restrictions on content and all kinds of things. Um, not that I'm trying to avoid the technical layer of the internet, which I will remind everyone is brilliant and has worked exceedingly well. Um, but um, I think there's a there's a the internet can become digital. We're talking about digital governance here rather than internet governance anymore. I think it would be clearer to use that term. Thanks. Thank you. Peace. Thank you, Paul. Peace, Oliver Muge, Mag, a member. So I want to come on the point of sustainability that Bruno brought up. I don't know if we put it there, if it makes sense. For me, uh, my understanding of sustainability is that it could actually cross, cut across all those that we've mentioned, because if we're talking about meaningful uh, access, if we're talking about data privacy or data uh, protection, we want to see the sustainability of it, it being uh, staying longer, you know, the sustainability. So I think probably does not fit there very well. We need to uh, think about it. Uh, but my understanding is that it should be everywhere. We're looking up at sustainability of all those that we are putting across. I don't know if my point is clear. Thank you. Thank you. And Chris, and then we'll have a break. It's a lot of pressure. <laughs> I'll keep it brief. Uh, um, I remember the things I was going to say. 
Uh, I, I absolutely think that the sustainability um, should should be there included as a theme. I think um, there is a need for us for the IGF to have messages on that, and so I think to have a theme for that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm it, when we've, we've talked about gender as a cross cutting thing, and I, I saw Adam mention mentioned something in the the chat there as well about it. Uh, I, I'd be interested to sort of get a sense of what we mean by that because i think it needs to mean a lot more than just we have gender balance in the the speakers and in the panels and everything i i think from what i'm understanding what we mean is that there should be consideration of the gender issues in relation to all of these these different points and i'm not quite sure how we're thinking that will happen or how to to ensure that um so i while i'm absolutely supportive of it i think it's it's something we need to think about the practicalities of what does that mean and how how would we sort of shape that in in a getting in um, proposals and then what we accept and how we put them together um and are we thinking for instance there should be messages also clearly coming out in relation to gender i think that would make sense but then we also need to think about the practicalities of how do you do that when it's not been an explicit theme it's more of an overarching issue um Oh, and sorry, that was the other thing. And I wanted to thank Bout, um, his comment about bringing um, the the different proposers for thematic um, workshops together. I, I mean, I think my initial response sitting here was, no way, that's not going to happen. And I very quickly come around to, but actually it might make sense to say if we have each theme, identify for each theme maybe two to three MAG members as shepherds, and just set up a mailing list for the organizers for workshops in that thematic group. And the MAG members could sort of work with those organizers to, as, as you say, ensure that there is not just a lot of duplication, same speakers, same issues. We're going to have a little bit of that no matter what, I'm sure. But this might at least give us a bit more sort of enduring connection with some of the workshop organizers over the course of the year um understanding that you know we're probably going to lose a lot of people over the summer no matter what but at least there would be that sort of connection and um yeah maybe we we could try and ensure a little bit more structure and and complementarity um between the different sessions within a theme so yeah I'd, I'd be interested in seeing if we could make something like that happen mm -hmm. uh chris on your gender thing one um thought I had is that we could also explicitly include in the workshop proposal form or in the instructions to the workshop proposers that when they discuss their topic, they should have some sort of agenda dimension to it. And part of the messages that coming out that they submit to the secretariat should a couple of them or one or two of them should have a gender message tied to their um, Topic that they are discussing, I mean, but that can be a discussion for this afternoon, not for now. <laughs> yes. So coming up on the lunch lunch break, um, I would like to propose that we do more or less what we did with the earlier discussion, and we we punted a little bit to the secretariat to do some wordsmithing and come back with something a little. Or cohesive than what we sent sent them out with, and I'd like to do that with this topic and give the secretariat a little free reign to take the input that we're. Then I can see that there's a bunch of it's been typed here, um, and and bring this back to us later this afternoon um, after having an, an opportunity to think about it and react um, pr practically. So if, if you don't object to that, then I'd like to suggest we adjourn for lunch and, and uh, ask that to the Secretariat, who has the messages. Uh, one question. Um, we'll try this afternoon. I don't know whether we can do it this afternoon. We might have to post it on the mailing list, but we'll give it a shot. Um, one other thing I just wanted to mention is that one of the aims for this year was as well to, to have some synergies between the G7 
and the IGF. And we should see as well, that's one of the things that we're going to do is to look at these topics and see if the G7 topics that are being discussed um, can be seen within here. And there may be some tweaking that may be needed just to make sure that it also um, encompasses that. So we're not just looking at New York, but we're also looking at the wider um, arena. Thanks. So anybody object? If there is no objection, then we're adjourned for lunch. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, um, and good evening and morning to those of us who are online, or those of you who are online. Um, uh, this is the afternoon session of the first day of the MAG meeting, and I do notice that we are losing some people because I know some people do have to take flights and uh, to go to Mexico for the ICANN meeting, so we might have fewer people tomorrow as well, um, but that is noted and we thank them for making the effort to come to this meeting here. Now, um, so with that, let me just hand it over to our chair, uh, Mr. Paul Mitchell, to start the meeting. Okay, so this is a session that um, is about flow 
of the program and how we imagine that working out. I know there's been work on strategy and focus on some of the offline areas. But I, at this point in time, want to open the floor to anyone who has a comment, a thought about the process and um, the overall flow for the uh, content at the at the IGF. No takers. It's going to be a pretty light conference. <laughs> Chris. Sure, I'll, I'll jump in here. Save us from the silence. Um, no, I mean, I think in terms of flow, if we're talking about the, the program, I think um, it, we there were some discussions even over lunch about, about that and about the relationship between main sessions and, and workshops and how to sort of ensure that that, that works um, effectively. Uh, and, you know, understanding that we will have main sessions over the full length of the week, um, but that perhaps a main session which occurs towards the end of the week after um, the workshops in its thematic track should be considered or structured a little differently to one that happens at the beginning is sort of going to happen before the, the workshops in the thematic track. Um, and so then how can we best prepare for that and best prepare um, people? And I think that's when we start looking at things like the proposal form and what information can be can be included there. Um, I'm not sure if the proposal form is on our agenda today or tomorrow, but um, I think that's, that's going to be certainly a... a useful discussion to have understanding that we've done that the working group has done an awful lot of work on that already and hopefully we're we're quite close to what the final version will look like thank you it's a great way to start other people who have views things they would like to see things they're concerned about related to how the conference will actually run uh, while you guys are thinking, one thing that we had was these uh, starting, I forgot what um, Lynn called them, but sessions at the beginning to start off the tracks and then a session at the end to summarize um, the track. Would that be of interest or you think that's too complicated? Just to, yeah. <laughs> yeah, trying to answer as well. Because we were, as Chris was saying, like during lunch, we were wondering what, what would be the roles of the main sessions? Should they be the ones that start the discussion on a, a specific track? Should they be the ones that would end or make like kind of a summary of all the debates during the IGF? I think there's a lot of questions about whether we should host main sessions on the last two days or the last day of the IGF as well, because we know like some discussions are not as good as they could have been on the first day, but we also know it's part of the agenda. Um, process. So um, there's a lot of ideas on even as Joyce was suggesting, like maybe having all main sessions in one day or like in two dedicated moments at the very beginning of the event, just so everybody could understand what they're all about and what these tracks are about. So um, these are some of the things we have been thinking or, or discussing. But maybe one thing I would like to recall from last year is for us to try to keep them, um, those slots for main sessions exclusively for the main sessions because we had some competing sessions last year I don't know if they were like I know I don't think they were workshops but some other things that were competing on that one slot and um just about like what is the relevance we're going to give to the sessions it's also important for us to discuss that's it uh, sorry can you clarify you we have a main session you don't want any parallel sessions uh that would make it difficult I think <laughs> I mean, if we're going to add sessions in the same slot, let's try to avoid at least having sessions from the same track against yes. mm -hmm. that one main session because it helps people follow the, the track itself in general. So, okay. yeah, I understood that. Yeah. 
<laughs> Joyce. Um, thanks very much, and, and thanks, Bruna, um, for sharing some of the ideas that we were discussing during lunch. Um, I might just share with everyone, I guess, the idea, which is which is that um, I think the observation is that main sessions, when when they are placed throughout the IGF main program over several days, because they run in parallel with many sessions at the same time those parallel sessions don't get as much interest because people want to be in the room in the main sessions. And so we're competing for interest. Um, and so my idea was, could we not just squeeze all the main sessions within like the first one, two days or something, try and minimize too many parallel sessions happening in those days, and then have the rest of the workshops and all that then carry on. So the idea is you, you not have so many parallel sessions in the first one, two days, and then those main sessions would then function as primers of the topic that would be discussed the rest of the days. And the reason for that is, and I think 2021, we had pre, uh, I don't even know what they were called, but pre kind of main session type sessions to, to sort of explain and introduce the topic to the audience. And then we had main sessions but then when the Mac tried to uh, organize both types of sessions, I think we ourselves are very confused uh, about the distinction and the purpose between those two sessions. So if we see the main sessions to help people understand a bit the background of the topic, um, what are some high level thinking in this area, and then get them ready for the IGF workshops and sessions, then perhaps we could just move them to the front uh, of the IGF itself. That, that was the thinking behind it. All right. Uh, sorry for being slow. <laughs> um, we've got idea program. We have 10 concurrent session rooms. We have the main sessions. So we would front load all the main sessions at the front would these main sessions be sequential or would the main sessions be all parallel running at, at the same time? No, not, not parallel. So sequential. And then we can still have some parallel sessions, but we try and minimize those so that they, they are not competing with the main sessions for those time slots as well. Okay, so we have a main session which is going on for two hours. Let's say we have four main sessions a day. I mean, four main sessions, we can accommodate four main sessions. And I'll also ask Eleanor to correct me if I'm wrong because she's more used to the um, scheduling aspect of it. Most of the other sessions are empty. Okay, so that's first point is, um, sorry, I'm just thinking this through. <laughs> so people would go to the main sessions. Yes, uh, I think that's a, on the top, that's a very good idea. But then we have a large venue, which has empty rooms, which has all this equipment and the usage statistic, which we also do, would be going down. So there will be kind of like a waste of resources as well. And we will also have main sessions that some people, the people who are interested in security issues may not be interested in some other issue. I um, won't name any other issue, but some other issues. So they'll be, they won't have something to occupy their time with, or they'll be forced into that main session. Um, these are just the problems that I'm having with it. And, but I think the most important thing is the usage thing, um, which we, we, we really can't do. Um, we, if we have a venue that we have to use the whole venue or we, um, make the conference smaller. So I think it's a good idea, but I find it a bit problematic in implementing. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. Um, yeah, I was also about to say, it, it, if you want to have the main sessions without parallel um, other sessions, it would really depend on the amount of main sessions. Um, and if you want to have all the main sessions on one day, as a participant, you would probably only be listening. Um, and um, because if you expect everybody to be in that room, I mean, you can't, you cannot participate a lot when there are over two, three, four, five hundred 500 people in the room. Um, so it wouldn't do much for interaction. And to be honest, I think that interaction should be stimulated much more than, than it is right now. Um, um, so yeah, I, I would definitely want to encourage in the, in the, in the workshop proposal for the, the people to, to ensure, um, more interaction with online and offline participants, um, more than it is encouraged now. Um, and, um, for the sake of people who want to propose a session, I would like to think or hear your opinions about the uh, many different types of sessions you can apply for, from varying from an open forum to town hall to lightning session, a workshop, workshop 60 minutes, 90 minutes. Um, I think it's rather confusing to have all these different types of sessions. It's also feedback that we got from the, the Dutch participants at the IGF. Um, and a lot of them have been to many IGFs and they were like, I have no idea what the difference is between all these sessions. And it's it's not clear in the scheduling. So that's uh, something I would like to have here on the record. Thanks. Uh, we'll just put up the um, sessions, uh, but peace. Jumbunen Mag member, I just want to suggest also if really required to have a preparation for the main sessions, maybe to have a, like a session preparatory phase session that we can do fully online before the before the IGF itself. We did that already, so. I think that can be done as well to to for capacity building and to ensure that everybody is talking about this uh, sub theme for these sessions. Yes, um, and and sorry to be always pointing out the other side of it <laughs> to be in contact. Yes, uh, we've done that before. We did have a uh, basically uh, a pre IGF. Uh, two weeks before. Um, it maybe, yes, we can um, relook at it, but then again, we have to think about how we're going to do it. Um, because uh, first of all, there is the fact that uh, people who are in the IGF do have um, day jobs as well. So if you have two weeks of, um, online sessions, and then you have a week again of um, in-person sessions as well. That takes, you, 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 you can't do anything else during that time. So do people, do, do people have that time to commit to it? And then there's also the, um, there was the issue of traveling. So do we have it like a month before the IGF, we have these two weeks, and then we have a break where people can travel to, and then that basically takes out um, more of the time. Um, of course, we can look at it and see how we can minimize and have maybe these um, pre-sessions. Um, maybe we can have per theme five sessions and we can have those online, not a huge uh, meeting, but those are just ideas. And also, I'm, I'm also saying this just to encourage some conversation as well. Uh, yes, Justin. Um, thank you, Cheng Yutai. <clears throat> yeah, I, this is kind of a conversation I think some of the some of us, other of us were having uh, over the, the lunch break. But I do think, you know, one of the challenges is we seem to 
really overcomplicate um, a meeting. Um, and, you know, I, I certainly trainings or guides or capacity building and all that's very useful, but maybe there's also some responsibility on the MAG and the organizers to streamline and simplify the IGF. I, I think I, I went to my first IGF in 2012. I've been to a lot, you know, since then. And, and if I was given a test right now on the difference between a policy network and a best practice forum and a, main, you know, main session and all the rules around organizing and how to fill out a workshop, I'm not, you know, convinced I would, I would pass that test. And so, you know, and that's, I feel like I'm, I'm fairly seasoned on the IEGF. Um, if we're encouraging youth, we're encouraging new stakeholders, we're encouraging others to come in. I mean, it is a complex system and, and you'd all do work, good work trying to organize it, but even the agenda, I sit there and look at it, trying to figure out all the different information and you know the way it's organized. So I, I think it would be useful to just try to simplify and streamline and just, I mean, we have a lot of meetings, that's fine. They're meetings, I mean, they're, they're workshops. You know, we don't have to kind of overcomplicate the process and all that. I know that's easier said than done, but I, I do want to throw it out there. And then also just on the schedule, though, I, I want to note that one thing we, we often forget in IGF is it is a networking event. And, and there is a lot of value in the meetings that are happening on the margins of the IGF. And so very tightly organizing an agenda. There's, you know, we, we, it needs to make sense, but at the same time, you do want to kind of have opportunities where folks are engaging in the corridors and meeting rooms and other things of that nature, because that's one of the real values. And it's one of also, I mean, frankly, one of the draws to get senior officials and others to come to this so they can do the bilateral meetings, they can do the other engagements. Uh, and so we wouldn't want to lose that as we structure the, the program. Thanks. Hey. Just, sorry, I'm just trying to organize this in a systematic way. Uh, one of the issues, Elisa mentioned uh, that the Dutch IG were, were commenting on the session types. Why don't we just deal with the session types right now to see what the comments are, and then we can move on to the next one, to the next issue on the scheduling. We have the session types up on the board. Um, these have been added through the years, yes, um, because uh, people had different needs. I mean, um, so what I can propose is that we can just do a quick rundown of the sessions and to see whether or not we should be merging some of them or just get the sense of the idea of what the Mac thinks if, yes, Chris. Mm -hmm. so, sorry, I know we're going to have a, a flag up, but just, I mean, I think these are, there are these four, these different sessions, but then there is also, and I think this might have been what Alyssa was talking about, in the workshop proposal form, all of those subgroups of different kinds of workshops. So you have workshop as one item there, but then in the form for proposing a workshop, you can choose from a debate or a round table or a town hall or a uh, so there, there are a number of different options there. So I'm not sure if they're all. It's, it's yeah. So it gets well, the, very complicated. Okay. Yeah. Well, the workshop proposal form. I will not delve into that. That is the domain of the working group on um, the MAG working group. So uh, that setup um, will leave them to deal with it. Um, for the main sessions. Um, we can have some quick comment here, or we can also assign that to the um, working group. Um, but uh, just to get your feeling, what do you think about these sessions? Are these ones okay? But yes. Just a quick comment, I, in, in more in more concrete terms. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. About the main sessions, I think um, one good proposal would be to not have it conflicting with any other workshops from the same track. That's kind of a good yes, compromise we could, mm -hmm. we could maybe achieve just so people could properly follow the tracks. Um, and also for the main sessions, I would again um, make the same point of us, about us having a compromise with gender balance and diversity. I do not, I mean, I, I would feel very sad in seeing another main session with just like one female speaker or one female in a moderator role, but I'm not just talking about gender balance, I'm talking about a more broad um, diversity because we also um, discussed having gender balance as a cross-cutting um, issue. 
about main main sessions again i think that if we, we could maybe try to merge them with the, the 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 idea of the preparation both for the workshops and main sessions by doing the whole idea of having mag members as the shepherds or the steering groups for each of the tracks and then we could host maybe just one informative session before the igf about what that track is about just to explain to the community what should be expected, what do we want, what is the description, the kind of the, the paragraph we have on the website and just try to, to dive into that a little more. And one last um, suggestion for me would be, we have been talking a lot about the cross-cutting um, subjects, um, both sustainability and gender. Maybe we could have them as topics for tom town halls because it would allow for more community participation and more open discussion. And it's also part of the agenda somehow. So let's try to make sure it kind of fits into and because I think it's gonna be super kind of like popular if we host a town hall about sustainability or gender or any other like new topic or something like that. So let's use those kind of more informal spaces to do also relevant discussions and to gather inputs from the community. So these are my suggestions. Uh, thank you very much. and. I've no, <laughs> there's, uh, yeah, I don't see any problems in those. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I'm just, a, I just did a quick count. Um, the open forum sessions and the town hall sessions in total are 74. Um, that's almost equal to the number of workshops that get into the program. I just, I don't know if perhaps this page, the link could be shared, you know, with in the chat or, or in some way so we could access it as well to see what were those topics that were being discussed there and were they really necessary to have, you know, so many of the open forums and town halls. I think some of the topics duplicated with what was being discussed at the workshops anyway, right? And because the MAG doesn't have oversight um, of those other sessions apart from the workshops, we might find topics being duplicated across different types of sessions. Um, and then the same people are talking about the same things over several days. Um, and that does add to the bulk of the program. Um, so, you know, if the issue is that we have so many parallel sessions being run every single day because we have to find space for all these other different types of sessions, um, perhaps we could try and streamline some of those. Uh, and then, you know, maybe the logistics requirements would also go down, perhaps. So maybe I think we need a, a, a bigger discussion around this. And I think observation over the years is also that people take the open forum town hall you know lightning talks etc as a way of circumventing having to submit a workshop i mean i'm just being very candid here which also you know adds to that issue of the same topics and people again and again featuring in the program yeah no understood um, marcus Thank you, Marcus Gomez speaking, my personal capacity as an IGF veteran. The origin of the town hall was we tried to bring in relevant organizations such as OECD, ITU, to give them a platform. And also the idea was that the IGF should be a one-stop shop for people who want to inform what's happening. But over the years, uh, there are indeed many, many more organizations wanted to make use of this. And as Joyce just said, it may well be uh, an element of trying to circumvent the MAG scrutiny. So there may be merit in revisiting the uh, procedure of that. Yes, of course, institutions such as the ITU, the OECD, they are important, and I think the MAG would agree that it's important to bring them in, but there should not be sort of easy entrance point for whoever. And yes, there is merit in having open forums, but I think there may be also merit in having more of a MAG scrutiny over what in the end gets accepted as an open forum. It, it is a 
delicate balance, I agree, but not every institution that benefited from the open forum is absolutely vital for the success of the IGF meeting. So that's my humble comment on this. Thank you. Yes. And also at the very beginning, we also had um, very strict cri criteria that it has to be a treaty based international organization. And then the uh, people like the civil society, et cetera, started to complain that, you know, that shuts out people. So, of course, when you start expanding, then, you know, these things um, start growing. But that point is well taken that we will do some sort of a review and just to see that not too much creep has come in and see if we can tighten it up a little bit now or a lot, uh, depending on the situation. But yes, yes thanks. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Jengitai. And maybe to add to that, um, uh, also really take a look at the, the lightning talks and the, well, networking session. Is it is the networking session really used as network for networking or um, yeah? Uh, uh, one other thing that we have to point out is that some of these sessions are not competing in the um, schedule during you know the opening and lunch. Some of them are lunchtime sessions. Some some of them are after sessions. Some of them are like the lightning talks are basically um, you know speaker speakers corner sessions that we have just an open mic and people can come in for thirty minutes or less to say something. So those are different types of sessions that are not full workshops. Just one individual coming up with an idea. And you know, like the Hyde Park speakers, uh, uh, speakers corner thing. So yes, so but we will take a look at them to see what is actually competing with that um, prime times, so to speak. Yeah. And if I may ask, is has the feedback been really positive from people who organized the lightning talk or were at the speakers corner? My regulation is that they were appreciated and it did give people who may not, who just have an idea, who they want to share and get some feedback on that idea. And so that's my regulation, but I'm just looking um, to see if there's any other um, input that I would say. Okay. I'm taking over from the chair, sorry. Maybe, let me. Take a step. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, Chris, then you said. Well, just to note, I know it was mentioned in the open consultation that mm. one of the pieces of feedback, and I think it resonated with me certainly, was that there was a sense that the venue for the lightning talks was a bit hidden away in the basement and that there weren't that many people attending as a result. Um, so I think that's something to pay attention to, but I think the format is very valuable and should be retained and maybe even grown because I think I think there were some really useful and interesting um discussions that I sort of sat in on often with one or two other people in, the, in that room I know, this year I mean the venue is fantastic there's no there were there's space for everything so um we're, we're really really lucky this year and we will um take full use and make sure that nothing is hidden away there are no hidden corners yeah this year. Mm. Thank you, uh, Chengatai and Lucien Castex for the record. Um, what's to build on the comment on of Chris? Indeed, for the for the lightning session, it's quite it's quite a good format. Uh, been following IGF since a few few years, 2017, and it's always been quite interesting. Wanted also to to reflect on the networking sessions. Uh, it's quite a good way, uh, for example, for research project. Uh, or project from civil society to have feedbacks from the IGF community. I attended a few um, last year and uh, also in Katowice. It was quite good. And it's not uh, an usual format. So the networking session makes uh, total sense, in my, in my opinion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you very much for that feedback. Yeah, that's important. Um,
Any other comments on the um, tracks? Um, nope. Yes, Chris. Sorry, I'll, sorry to take the mic again. Um, just, I, I mean, I wanted to maybe hark back to something Justin said earlier um, about the the different tracks and not getting too complicated. Um, I think we had discussed the possibility of that um, having one, two, three mag shepherds for each track and working with the organizers. Um, I, I think probably it, there's a bit of a, an opportunity there to um, not be too prescriptive in what each, how those tracks then play out. So in, in some cases, there may be interest in doing a pre-session remotely that could prepare people for the information in the track and give give some groundwork in another sense it might in another track it might might make sense to sort of have a, a web page which with links to various um important details but perhaps the mag shepherds and the organizers of the sessions in that track could come up with the best approach themselves um, because it might not be the same for each track uh thank you yes yes um Thank you, Chingatai. So just to, to clarify, everybody here in the room wants to keep all the different types of sessions. That's the consensus. Yeah, what I heard is that, um, yes, and thank you, yes. That's what we're, so if there's any loud objection, please object now. What I heard is that we are keeping all the sessions, but we are going to be doing a review to see um, that these sessions, such as open forums and town halls, aren't workshops in disguise, that they are being used for their intended um, purpose. And if there are some that are uh, as we think that are supposed to be in other sessions, then we will see how we can tighten that criteria to make sure that um, they are used for their intended purpose. Mm. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you, Chengatai. So if if the um, the amount, so if if it plays out that several open forums or town hall sessions are actually, or last year were actually workshops, should then the number of uh, allotted workshops increase and the, um, the number of allotted open forums and town halls be decreased? Um, I won't give exact figures now because it also really depends on um, what's going to come in in the proposal process. But um, yes, so it's basically an exercise in closing of loopholes uh, to see that there are no loopholes. If there are, I mean, workshops have a set purpose. Open forums have a set purpose. We do not want to um, put an exact figure as such on these workshops because it also depends on um, on the input that we received. But yes, um, the main and what should be the most should be the workshops, right? But we should also make sure that, I mean, the open forums are there for a purpose for these organizations. They should have a space. Also for the town halls, um, networking sessions, as I say, don't really compete because they're basically in the gaps. So we'll keep those. Um, but I feel that I'm repeating myself, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Justin and then Bruna. Yes. Uh, thank you. Yeah, just, and on that, I mean, yeah, between the workshops and the open forums and town halls, it'd be useful to kind of understand the difference and, and what are the different roles. Could you also explain between the high level sessions and the main sessions, 
you know, the difference there, because I think they do seem to have a, a similar feel. Um, and then I was just curious, what are the closed sessions? Um, and and I see seven. I can think of, you know, maybe two, but I just wonder what those meetings are that are happening at the uh, IGF as well. Thanks. I do understand. I see seven, but while I refresh uh, refresh my memory, we'll see, we'll have Bruna and then Merit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, um, just a quick suggestion. Maybe is there a possibility we could put a cap to how many town halls, open forums, and all of these sessions we want to have in the end? I know it's based on kind of like community demands, and it might look not as nice for us to limit that. But we're also like being aware of how many sessions we're allowed to have. So. Consider, considering maybe a cap to these two would be interesting. And I think that the whole problem about um, open forums disguised as like workshops disguised as working as open forums happens the other way around as well, because like some people still use the workshop space to let's say launch books or their companies or um, organizations initiatives and everything else. So it might be worth also reviewing what are we actually allowing into the workshop space and, and just saying like maybe a launch of a book is for an open forum or a town hall or something like that yeah it's a launch yeah or a networking event so yeah just first to maybe dive into those categories as alisa was suggesting just so we can have a better and proper um distribution yeah yes and uh Marit here yeah thanks um so i in principle support some kind of a streamlining and I'm preferably quite a thorough streamlining I think uh, it is a bit difficult to see how that could be done I, I think I'm aware of most of the sessions the only one I don't know what it is is the networking session which would seem to be for networking but as to whether it's there's something substantive going on or uh, if it's a cocktail or uh, and how, how do you get that approved, I wouldn't know. I think also then uh, one thing is the number of the sessions to see. And, and I think it would be also then worthy to see if especially the open forum or the town halls could be somehow streamlined to the track. track so at least check if there's some kind of additional value or contribution. Uh, maybe that can be done by the secretariat, I don't know, or the mag. Um, but but yeah, and then there's the whole bulk of the intersessional work, which is of course valuable. Um, but also maybe for newcomers, especially, would be good to indicate it in the program. And I don't remember if it's already indicated that this is intersessional kind of ongoing work, and it's different from the well the the, the other sessions somehow. And thanks. All right, thank you um, for the closed sessions. Why don't we just click on the link? <laughs> um, Eleonora or whoever's, can we just click on the link? So basically it's just, um, this is uh, youth volunteers, um, APNIG. I don't recall what APNIG is, but it sounds <laughs> Asia Pacific, -y, but uh, <laughs> um, MAG session and also the leadership panel. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the APNIG is the African Parliament. Ah, yes, sorry. Talk African Parliamentary Network on Internet Governance. <laughs> right, exactly. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yes, I, th I think there is value to these sort of closed sessions as such, because we do want, I mean, uh, the IGF is also a place where at the rare occasions, you know, disparate groups can get together and they can have their closed session meetings. I think if there's room allows and it doesn't interfere with an open session, let them, I would say, yes. Mm. But also, um, I think we are, I think the next session is we are going to get a review and another review of the workshop proposal form as well, um, if I'm correct, right? And the working group is going to go through 
that form with us in, for the next session today? Yes. Okay, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, Joyce. Thanks, Chengatai. Um, so I've been running through the open hall sessions and just clicking in into a few to just get a general sense of what they are like. I think majority of the open forum sessions are single institutions or organizations that would like some discussion on a certain topic. Mm -hmm. And they may or may not have speakers from across other organizations or from the same one. So clearly, if it's a single institutional organization trying to want to have a session at the IGF, they won't be able to go through the workshop route because we have very well-defined parameters for what would go through. And these types of sessions wouldn't necessarily go through, for example, the diversity type you know, uh, checkpoints that we have. And so I, I understand why some of these institutions may feel the need to have an open forum in that regard. But then if that's the case, perhaps we might consider instead of lumping everything into just open forum, uh, have maybe another subcategory that is like showcase sessions. You know, institutions that just want to talk about themselves or talk about their work for the year or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and then we can put those kinds of sessions into showcase sessions. And then the open forums can be truly what they were intended for as an open forum you know, inviting people to participate, et cetera. So that might help. I'm not sure. Okay. No, no, we'll create another category. And <laughs> yes, but yes, I, I get your point. Sorry, um, but I get your point. Uh, Marcus. Again, Marcus Gomez here in my personal capacity. And again, the history of the open forums originally was precisely what you just said, Joyce, they were showcased. The idea was let's bring in relevant organization to tell us what they have been doing over the years. So we know up to speed what the OECD is doing, the ITU is doing, ICANN is doing. But again, I think there is merit for the MAC to revisit the whole concept and also to redefine the criteria. Clearly, I thought, saw it in the chat. I think Lito mentioned how important it is to build bridges to important institutions and how to do that. I think uh, it has sort of over the years expanded and many organizations took advantage of that as an easy way in to have a space in what some people used to call prime real estate, to have a slot at the IGF and without the supervision of the MAG. So there definitely would be merit in redefining the criteria and the showcase element. I think there is merit in that to people to know what's happening there, but it's not really open forum in a sense of that you discuss issues. And also over the years, many of these institutions then redefined the concept. They did not use it as a showcase, but they created a kind of workshop on issues that were important to them. Again, there is merit in that, but it creates a duplication to workshops which are under the supervision of the MAG. And then there were similar type of sessions which were totally outside the guidance and supervision of the MAG. So this is just a a few words to explain a little bit the history and the mag may consider <laughs> these elements in their wisdom in your wisdom as to redefine the criteria thanks for your attention and we'll also post a link with the explanation of all these sessions and i would also like to add that some of these sessions were created because we looked at the attendance right and we say, okay, so we are missing governments, we are missing these um, IGOs, what would bring them to the IGF? So that was a response. So that's why we do have this mix so that we can be attractive to these various needs, not just to one particular group. Elisa, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Chang'e Tsai. Maybe um, in that sense, a confession to make 
is um, that I um, um, I got encouraged by some people to uh, hand in a, a session as an open forum because chances of it getting elected or chosen are uh, much more grand than with a workshop proposal. So, um, yeah, it, it well in that sense. Um, using the system <laughs> um but yeah maybe maybe if we um if you if we become more strict on what can be an open forum and um being more flexible in, on what is is a workshop um you would get more as a workshop and then it well it will be weighed in the full um with in comparison with all the other workshop proposals and instead of having this subsection of of disguised workshops as open forum. Um, yeah, thanks. Yes, Joyce. Just to quickly add a plus one to what Lisa said, I, I have to admit in my mind, we have several years not being able to get workshops through the actual workshop system. And it's a huge temptation to go through the open forum instead. So I, I do understand, thanks. Okay, and we will be consulting with you two on how we can close that particular loophole, but thank you, yes. <laughs> Do we have any other? Uh, yes, it's Jorge. I should have just say the name automatically, but yes, Jorge. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Changyutai, Jorge Gansias with government. I also have to confess that we have been using the, the open forum um, slot uh, for having organizing sessions. I think this has to do uh, on the one side with how governments work. And uh, it's quite difficult for, for us, even for the Swiss government, to organize a workshop proposal that fits all the criteria very early in the year. So, because amongst other things, we, we don't know by then uh, how our situation will be when the, the IGF takes place. So uh, that's one, one reason. And I think that uh, especially governments and also IGOs still are uh, to a certain extent underrepresented in the IGF. So I understand if uh, the number of open fora for is limited, but uh, I, I think we, we should leave this door open for having more participation from IGOs and governments, which uh, struggle, I think, with the workshop proposal process. And uh, yeah, I, I think also that, uh, it's a good evolution, uh, really, that uh, some open fora uh, feel like workshops because this is uh, uh, an attempt to make them more interactive, more diverse, and uh, less of a, just a showcasing or a unilateral communication. So just these words to, to defend a little bit the, the concept and goals of the open fora. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Oya. Um, okay, I will have Bruna, Lucien, and then Walt, because yes. Um... Thank you. No, just to point out, because I think we have two different types of overlaying um, categories of sessions. First, we have the main sessions that can be a little bit overlaying what I'm calling this high level cluster that are the main sessions, the high level sessions, the parliamentary track. They all kind of overlay in some point and they don't really have a lot of communication between each other. And that, and that would be something good to have a little more coordination or, or just an information process between the three of them. I know each of them are organized by a different part within the, the programming committee, but uh, it would be good to like setting a better um, conversation line between the organizers on this tree. The other one is, is this that we're talking about, the showcase kind of cluster, which are the open forums, the town halls, um, the launches and awards and, and things like that. And 
although I, I, I do see value on, on what Jorge was saying, that let's keep the, the, the door open to bring in more people to join the IGF space, it's also somehow problematic that this is used to, to kind of overcome the, the process. Because um, in the end of the day, we kind of end up with sessions that are less diverse, not multi-stakeholder, with um, limited time for participation and discussion, and they're mostly presented in um, panel formats instead of like open discussions with the community. I don't even know if there is a way of like changing that, but maybe what we can also ask from open forum organizers mostly is that is this compromise with the broader dialogue with the community and that they have a more kind of participatory or even open um, way of doing these discussions instead of just having a 50 minute panel without questions and to just present an initiative that community doesn't really have a chance to weigh in or comment. So maybe we can ask for more participation in that one and, and instead of like necessarily closing the door, but it, it is indeed a problem. And just for the record, I never submitted an open forum. So <laughs> on the good side. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Lucien, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chiang Um uh, two two quick points. Um well i submit i never submitted Acer open forums, but I submitted tunnels, uh, networking sessions and uh, workshops, obviously. Um I find merits in uh, each of them, but sometime maybe streamlining them to actually understand the differences uh, would be great. And maybe having a more integrated program in which each uh, category of session is visible in the thematic tracks we were discussing earlier. Uh, and would also second the comment uh, by Jorge earlier, uh, it's sometimes very complicated to meet the, the schedule uh, of the IGF when you are uh, from government uh, into processes, sometimes a bit intricated, um, which might explain uh, <laughs> the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shingatai. Uh, about Donatus, I like Marcus's description <laughs> as a veteran. I think I can call myself that. Uh, just a minor comment, full disclosure that Lisa put in that open forum was probably because I suggested it, <laughs> but then they wanted to showcase the internet.nl. So it belonged to an open forum. What I think is hard to understand being in this room every year is that a lot of people don't understand what the difference is. So these people wanted to organize a workshop and I said, it's not smart. You probably net not get it because you're not diversified enough, but you want to showcase something, use another format. So I think that 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 is one comment. The other comment is that we need to realize how difficult it is to write a good proposal. And that is something which is, I think, overlooked because organizations that live from writing proposals will come up with the best proposals for an IGF workshop. And what we have noticed in the past 10 years that we see governments drop away from proposals. We see technical community dropping away. We see industry dropping away. And that is because the difficulty of finding the time to write a good proposal, be able to write a good proposal. So should be looking at the relevance of a topic be considered as well. And perhaps if they meet to, to women or men less or not have somebody from Asia, that is something that can be mended with a little aid. But if the topic is relevant, then it should have perhaps a little precedence over the less urgent parts of the proposal. But that makes it hard because it, when, what, is some, what makes a proposal urgent or relevant? But it's something that needs to be discussed if we want to have a diversified program, a more diversified program, and be more inclusive to the communities that seem to be dropping away in the past 10 years, little by little. So let me stop there just as, as an advice. So thanks for the attention. Uh, thank you, Art. Yes. Um, those are good points. Thanks. Um, Don't have any. 
other input, we can go to the workshop proposal form. Would that be possible? Yes. Uh, can I, someone going to project it? Yes. Um, else you can, if you're in the um, uh, Zoom, you can project it via Zoom. Mm. We can wait a little bit, but uh, just hold on. Uh, while we're waiting for that, I can just give the floor to our co-chair um, just to say a little bit about the um, uh, G7 um, topics for the digital and tech um, track. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Secretariat and the uh, uh, the host country co-chair uh, Yoichi Ida again. Uh, so let me uh, briefly introduce uh, what we are doing uh, in uh, G7 this year, uh, which uh, we are taking the, the uh, presidency in the rotating uh, system. Uh, in the G7 uh, uh, work stream, uh, we have uh, summit uh, among uh, uh, national leaders uh, and under the summit process uh, we have different uh, uh, categories of uh, at ministerial level and this year we are uh, preparing uh, digital and tech, uh, tech ministers meeting uh, which will come at the end of april and uh, now uh, in, in, in our preparation, we are discussing several uh, topics uh, in our agenda. And one of uh, uh, the topics uh, is uh, internet uh, governance or to promote uh, open, free and uh, secure or uh, resilient internet. And uh, uh, under this uh, item uh, uh, of discussion, uh, we are, uh, we, I mean, the G7 uh, government uh, are discussing how government can take its role in promoting uh, internet governance and uh, internet uh, uh, open, uh, global, open, free, and uh, uh, secure internet uh, around the world by joining uh, the multi-stakeholder uh, uh, community. So what we are discussing, it's uh, uh, just uh, we, we are uh, uh, looking over uh, the different work streams such as uh, uh, U.S. government initiative or European uh, initiative, and also looking at the uh, initiatives at uh, uh, private sector level. And of course, we are looking at what uh, uh, IGF is working. So one of the ideas is uh, uh, Fortunately or unfortunately, I, I don't know, but uh, we Japan is taking uh, the role of uh, G7 presidency at the same time uh, with the uh, uh, IGF host country. And taking this opportunity, uh, we are trying to, to strengthen the synergy between the discussions at governmental forum of G7 and multi-stakeholder forum of IGF uh, uh, to by connecting the discussions and also the participants from uh, uh, in each uh, work stream uh, uh, with each other. So uh, uh, in our first and the second working group session, uh, we have invited uh, Mr. Chengetai Masango, uh, uh, as a, a knowledge partner to make input, to explain uh, what uh, IGF has been doing over the last uh, years. And uh, uh, we are uh, discussing uh, together uh, what we could do uh, all together uh, between G7 government and multi-stakeholder community. So uh, the idea is uh, we are uh, trying to to take some sessions or some 
uh, event uh, in the uh, on the occasion of uh, Kyoto IGF and uh, 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 where uh, those uh, stakeholders from the government and uh, other communities work together uh, and uh, uh, discuss ways, possible ways to strengthen uh, our collaboration and try to find uh, the future ways to to uh, develop and improve the collaboration between not only between the government and the private sector, but also among all different kinds of uh, stakeholders. And uh, we hope uh, this can be one of the uh, opportunities to create uh, the more uh, enhanced uh, way of uh, collaboration uh, between uh, government uh, uh, fora are not only limited to G7, but also uh, G20 and others, and multi-stakeholder uh, fora uh, of IGF uh, toward the uh, future uh, uh, development. So that is uh, what we are discussing, and uh, we want to, to uh, I wanted to share the situation with you and uh, probably uh, 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 hope to uh, listen uh, to your proposals and advices and uh, probably we may uh, think uh, together uh, what we can do together on the occasion of uh, Kyoto IGF. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Kaoche. Um, that was just for the information while we were waiting and also I think I thought we thought that it was important that you know, um, you be briefed on what's happening between the G7 and um, the IGF. Um, if you, yes, Chris. Thanks, Cheng uh, Yeah, thank you very much for this information. I, I, I think this is what um, there'd been some discussion. We we heard Cheng was yeah. attending those meetings, and I think that that kind of synergy is is really valuable. So I I think well, I don't speak for the MAG, but certainly for myself, I think. Um, I can see this is a really positive opportunity, and I'm I'm glad that it's very high on the agenda um, for the for the IGF hosts in in making this work. And I, I hope also that um, the MAG will be able to contribute to making this uh, a sort of an effective part of the IGF program. So um, I guess looking there to sort of not not obviously secretary will have a very strong role, but also please do include the MAG um, and involve us in. As, as this goes forward um, to help in any way we can. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, yeah. Any other comments? If not, because we're a little bit early, but that is also fine. Um, we can go to the next part. Um, okay, peace, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Ngitai. For records, my name is Peace Oliver Muge, MAG, MAG member, but I co facilitate this working group with Lito, who is out, and uh, with support from Alinora. So, um, thank you, Chris. Are you the one uh, projecting? Okay. <laughs> no problem. Okay, Alinora, yes. <laughs> Okay, so we have been working with the working group on this uh, form. And uh, before we start going through it, maybe I could just point out some of the things that changed. Uh, one is that we introduced the word count so that we can have uh, the proposals with, with you know, quality proposals before we've had issues where, you know, proposals were writing so many things and when you're evaluating or reading through, you could hardly get points or get, you know, understand what they're talking about. So that's something that we, we introduced. And then also we put this introductory part that uh, we can see. And then also, yeah, and so we can, we can just start going through it. And so we've really emphasized the issue of diversity uh, so that we ensure that the proposers or the organizers are able to see that and able to follow that and are able to consider that. The issue of hybrid definitely, and uh, we emphasized having some speakers and organizers being on site and some can join online, but at least the emphasis has been there. 
And then uh, the issue of contact person, the organizer, it's always been hidden. And we've been, uh, it's something that I also mentioned the other time that uh, we think that it's important to have the organizers known uh, to the mug when we do evaluation, this could help uh, to ensure that uh, we are not giving session to only the same same uh, organizers. We've realized that uh, I think we were able to see that uh, sometimes the same organization has, you know, many sessions, four, five, you know, sessions. So it's nice if we know uh, who the organizers are and also to help, uh, for instance, we have newcomers that come in that are not able to really put uh, very quality, you know, proposals. But uh, it's very nice if we know that these are newcomers, then we could be considerate when we read uh, some of these proposals. And then, uh, yeah, and then we, we also requested if we could have this form a little bit easier for, for the organizers when they're putting it together, they're able to save, I think maybe, uh, Louis will will give us a, a response on this. And so then we can just go through. You all received uh, this form. So I guess you had an opportunity to read through it, but I will just go through it and pulling out some of the key, some of the issues that we thought uh, the mug could discuss. And one of it is already the issue of anonymity and, and uh, hiding the, the organizers. And so the issue with these messages, we're wondering that should we only consider the previous IGF, like the 2022 messages, or should we consider, you know, um, sessions uh, continuing with conversation that, that, uh, that could have probably happened in 2021 or 2020, but not only targeting 2022. Yeah, we can go on. Yes. Yeah, and then here is still the issue of hybrid, the emphasis on hybrid. We had discussed it and some group members thought maybe it's nice we just say, okay, uh, if there are five speakers or six speakers, three of them should be there on site and three of them should can join online and same with facilitators or moderators. Uh, but we also think that it's maybe not nice to dictate that but we just want to ensure that that is emphasized and the people who are organizing these sessions are aware that aware of our our importance you know the value to having you know speakers on site and not having the same issues we've had where some uh sessions don't have speakers at all or a facilitator on site and we have to look for sometimes mug members for for instance last year Kerry you had this uh this experience to 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 moderate a session that you were not aware of uh yes we can go on yeah and then we also had you know we 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 discussed I remember the issue of S DGs to ensure that it's, you know, we're not asking people to really put so much, but at least we should have a drop or a checklist that we've put there where, you know, all these uh, uh, goals are listed and someone is able to relate or pick out on the ones that relate to what uh, the topic that they're proposing. Yes, thank you. We can go on. Yes. Yeah, I think I think that's about it. Uh, this is still this highlighted uh, part is still talking about the emphasizing the need to have the hybrid and the speakers on site and on online. So I guess those are some of the things that uh, that the group thought uh, we could bring uh, to the mug, and we would really appreciate if we could have this uh, form approved. But uh, that's it from the group. And if there's any group member would like, oh, yes, Lita, you're welcome. We're just going through the, the form. And if you have anything to add, and we have the some of the group members in, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Peace. Um, so this is the second time 
it was presented um, in the virtual call and now it's presented now. I know there were some questions about the um, session formats that um, came out and um, before the chair approves this, we would like just to have a final chance for feedback, or you can tell us that we need uh, you need more time, but it has been it has been made available for quite some time. Um, but yes, uh, we're here to uh, push it through any final comments, uh, and then um, the chair will call whether or not it should be approved. So I did maybe because I was looking here, I did see Elisa, then Bruna, and then Lito. So we'll take it um, like that. And then also another way we can do it is, of course, instead of the whole thing, we can go section by section. But I think that has already been done in the working group, section by section. But um, for general, Elisa, please. Thank you, Chengatai. Um, just about the different session formats. Um, so there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different types of session formats for for a work um uh, i'm not sure if that's like making it more easy for for newcomers to know what to choose and um it might be my ignorance but i actually i only learned about a birds of a feather um at a technical meeting um and um so I'm, i wasn't aware of this type of session before that. Um, maybe if you want to attract um, or be more appealing to different types of groups, birds of a feather is not the best type, especially not to put as first option of the different options um, that we have as workshops. Um, and the second thing, um, it's not per se that it's that it should be in this workshop proposal, but I do think it's good to know on forehand, because I, I believe there was some discussion about this last year in the MAG, if uh, MAG members can also be uh, speakers or moderators of um, sessions, um, um, but I might be needing to look at other MAG members for this one, but I, I, I think that should be clear on forehand for, for MAG members if they can speak or not. Thanks. Um, thank you. I will give it to you to coordinate the response since you're facilitating the uh, work group. So from what I gathered, one question was the number and type. Is it conducive for new people who are coming in and also the order of choice of these sessions? And also um, the last question was MAG involvement as speakers or moderators, but Lucien, you're speaking to this, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very briefly, uh, quite agree with Alisa. Um, could be confusing between, you know, debate uh, type of session. I miss also uh, workshops in, in disguise. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, the, the formats uh, sometimes are confusing. So may, maybe streamlining it would make it better or maybe explaining uh, a bit more uh, what the merits of the different uh, type of sessions. And the second point, um, while um, reading the document also, was on the participation on site, um, obviously it's great to have when you have an hybrid format participation uh, remotely and uh, on site as well, but sometimes you, you know that very, very late uh, in the process, uh, could be last minute, um, so it could be quite a difficult one to actually meet um, in advance, uh, I guess. Thank you. Thanks, Chingatai. Um, and taking up the point on birds of feather, uh, I agree. I think outside of the technical community, maybe this is not a term that is very commonly used for conferences. So we do have like, I saw 30, 60 and 90 minutes birds of feathers. Perhaps instead of using birds of feathers, uh, we could instead have a different format. So fireside chat 
is something I've seen across different types of conferences. Maybe 30 minute or 60 minute fireside chat could be a new kind of session. And that might also help some of those institutions where they, they want to showcase themselves or they have something, one very specific topic that they want to talk about and use the fireside chat as, as a session format, then they, they may feel more encouraged about submitting a workshop to the MAG um, as opposed to trying to circumvent the system. So that's one suggestion. I think fireside chats can be quite interesting uh, and something different in, in the sessions. Thanks. Thank you, Shingatai. No, um... I don't think birds of a feather is that strange, but I think like Brightcon also implemented it in some ways. But maybe I, my suggestion would be to look at the formats more into what do we want to achieve in the end of the day instead of like just it being a panel or a roundtable or a, a fireside chat. Because like I again like just quoting Brightcon, I think they they kind of found out a, a really interesting approach to this that is like. What do we want? Do we want to kind of like um, just promote a broad discussion or do we want to deepen um, the understanding in one specific topic or just we just want to like collect inputs in some of the things and and when maybe it's worth like looking at this and seeing what's what's the end goal for each of them because I think that in the end of the day what we want is actually like participation and not just like a 40 minute panel with just four people speaking, no interaction from the IGF community. And I think here that the proposal is a little bit different. So um, maybe uh, my suggestion here would be like, I don't really understand what could, what is actually the difference between uh, debate, round table and panel. <laughs> that's, the, that's the three that are a little bit conflicting for me because they kind of all head towards the same direction. Maybe we can add one or two, like maybe the first side chat is one of them, but at one or two more interactive um, session formats. That's that's it. Thanks. Thanks. Um, speaking quite quickly here, I'm sure. Um, my suggestion is to burn this all down. <laughs> um, let's make it 30, 60 or 90 minutes and leave it at that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure why, what, what it benefits us to spell it. I, we can certainly have a link to this page on the website and say, here are some ideas for different formats you could use, but I'm not sure it actually matters that much to us in our selection process and people can reference this page and the, the format they're using if they want to. But my experience of past IGFs is that it doesn't make much difference. You basically, okay. you end up with a room full of people and some people talking and others sitting there and listening. And there are a lot of factors that go into determining whether that works really well or it doesn't work so well, but I'm not sure that <laughs> making people choose from this is actually that helpful there. Uh, just my comment before we go to Marie Leza. Um, for the Secretariat, I think our main concern is whether or not you want a round table or a panel, uh, the room format, not the session format, if that um, makes sense. And I'm thinking that maybe the format also has a uh, determination on the panelists. So if you are a panel format, you know, you have your panels. If you're a round table, there's more speakers. So that's uh, what I'm getting, but Maria Leza, please. And mm -hmm. he's just going to respond to everything just now. So. <laughs> well, thank you, Shangatai, for giving me the chance. To me, the most important format thing um, I can think of is actually that, you know, who, whoever is called to speak has a, has a, a represents different stakeholders, you know, uh, in the sense, because one thing that strikes me as interesting about the, the process is that as, mo as most stakeholder is designed to be, when you end up with sessions, uh, whatever they are, high, you know, open forum or, you know, whatever it is, what you end up with is a single type of stakeholder or, or two at, at, at best. 
you know, so you have civil society and an international organization, you have this, but you don't have really a multi stakeholder dialogue going in which the technical community talks to governments that talks to international organizations that talk that all together focusing on one particular issue. And that makes a tremendous difference because sometimes what, uh, you know, just an example, what the human rights, uh, uh, you know, uh, advocates want, it's unfeasible technically, or it's, you know, or vice versa, you know, it's a, um, and, uh, you know, so that kind of conversation has a tremendous value. And, and uh, so what prompted me to say that is because when you see a format like birds of a feather, it makes sense that then, the, you know, for a, a specific group like technical community comes together or, or advocates come together to have a discussion, but the others should be most stakeholder by design. Otherwise, you know, what you have is not a true mode stakeholder conversation. You have a, this, all the groups in one building, but not talking to each other. You know, and that's to me is the biggest thing about uh, about this this format process. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank thank you, Shengda. Uh, just just to I think echo what uh, what what uh, she pointed out. I think if you look at the practicality of of um, you know most most of the sessions, even last year, um, in 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 a number of uh, sessions, you'd find that due to the to the to the to the setup, you'd find that um, I, I don't know it could be the time allocation, but also it could be the, the actual setup itself where you know you have only the people at the high table like you know the setup that you have, we have now and then we just listen to the discussion and then by the time everyone respond to the questions that they were asked the time is already done and then obviously everyone who was in in, in the room actually leaves so that begs to actually to, to raise the question on whether the much stakeholder or the, the, the focus groups are actually discussing these issues or they're just going there to listen to what the panelists are saying without interjecting and, and also raising their own concerns. So I think it's it's something that needs to be looked holistically um, by looking at where we're coming from, what has worked and, and, and how we can actually better uh, improve those. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I'll turn to Peace for her reaction to it uh, about the um, order, about the session types. Shall we burn it all down and just have three sessions about how we should, um, are these formats conducive to a discussion or is it more of, uh, you know, speechifying? Um, if the working group has looked at that, um, if, do you have any reactions to that? And according to the timeline, of course, I mean, we can give you a little bit of time, but not that much because we do have to um, have the call outs soonish, but we can give you a week, but um, please, yes, your initial reactions. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you very much, Ingita. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. So one, the one question that I cannot answer is the question about the mug uh, speaking or organizing, being part of, yeah, speaking or or facilitating sessions that I cannot answer. And then I think this feedback is good. We also had these discussions in the group. And I remember, Leonora, we asked if there are people who are applying for some of these sessions. And yes, I think that's what uh, we confirmed that there's people who are applying for these sessions, meaning that people actually do understand them. Maybe we need to do more trainings and more, you know, let people know about it because if you can go to this link, then you're able to understand what it means so even if in the group here we might think that only um let's say panel or group discussion is what is ideal it's also nice that we have you know uh there are more people can choose people have opportunity to choose the issue about the name maybe you feel the name uh is not so catchy the fire or something name is more catchy i think I think it's totally fine, but I, I can't I can't decide that. But we had the similar discussions definitely. And then uh the issue about uh having all these multi-stakeholders together but not uh interacting among themselves. I think also we need to do, we talked about actually the emphasis of training the organizers, because uh the organizers need to know that this um 
sessions should be interactive. So we need to emphasize that and do trainings for them prior to the forum so that they are aware of engaging people who are on site and people who are online. So I think Shengetai, those are some of the responses that I can give. Uh, the rest are really things that I, I cannot decide upon, but uh, yes, the group would be happy to, to have further discussions. Okay, so um, the question for you is, and I don't, I don't know if you can answer me now, but what the, okay, my first comment is, I am sure that not everybody in this room has gone through this form and clicked that link, most appropriate format, they just saw birds of a feather and said, what is that? But it's clearly explained um, here. So, and that is part of the challenges that we have as well. Um, but yes, I mean, the explanation is there. So if it's amb ambiguous, ambiguous, this, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the explanation is there. All the explanation can be also expanded if people could not get the sense of it from that explanation. So, and this is the challenge that we have faced, you know, in all websites and um, distribution of information. It may be in front of you, but people just don't click that extra step. Um, my question to you would be, would you want a little bit more time to look at this and see whether or not you want to make some changes such as the um, resorting of these things? Or do you think that the group has decided and it's really not that worthwhile going through? Um, that's I'm my question. At their faces. <laughs> uh, Joyce. Mm. Thanks, Shingatai. Um I think before we get to asking the working group, they <laughs> want to go back to this again. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm sensing fatigue coming yeah. from that mm -hmm. side of the room. Um, I, th I think we do have one more section to discuss around the contact persons and anonymity, wasn't it? Um, you know, so maybe if we can resolve some of these things, then oh, okay. we might not so have to take it section, back. So, okay, we'll hold yeah, that we section. We can hold to later, yeah. Yeah, and then for the, um, whether MAG can, I mean, we had this discussion. Um, I don't think MAG can be moderators, et cetera, because that is sort of like a higher conflict of interest when selecting workshop. Um, I think panelists is only three, um, please remind me. No, the rule has always been that MAG members can be neither speakers nor moderators. There you go. So the answer is no, uh, because there's, you might favor something that you're in, and that's a bit difficult. Again, this is the MAG rule, and you're the MAG, so if you want to change the rule, you can, but that has been the ongoing rule. Uh, Lito, you, is it still not your time yet? Or we can go to Chris and um, Bruna? We can go to that because mine is totally different. Okay, fine, okay. And <laughs> also Teresa. Yes, uh, Carol. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just an observation from looking at the proposals. I'm not sure if persons really understand what is expected of a policy question. So maybe a little bit more guidance on what a policy question or some kind of structure. If that's okay with uh, UPS, that is noted down. We can have some more points. And also let's note that there are going to be sessions that we can people who are doing um, workshop proposals can come and ask questions. And I think that's important that we have some online sessions, which hopefully the um, working group will also volunteer for. And we can have a couple to suit the different time zones um, so that we have. And we hope that we will also have, and this is going back from suggestions from um, years gone by, that we also have some mentoring as well for those who um, are not used to doing these um, workshop proposals, because as has been said, there are organizations who are 
you know, um, set and know how to do these um, workshop proposals, but we also want to expand those uh, non-professional um, workshop organizers. But I am quite certain uh, piece that the group has is committed to that, right? To Yes, okay, great. Chris and Bruna. <laughs> Um, so um, not what I was planning to say, but just in relation to um, Carol's comment there, I think that's actually um, quite a useful point because I I was in the work of the working group, I was sort of thinking as part of policy questions as a bit of a um, legacy thing that was there and was useful. Henriette's mail this morning, I think, noted that it was a bit of an experiment a couple of years ago and hasn't necessarily been utilised much. So... You know, I I think generally the, def the default here should be to simplify where at all possible. And if policy questions don't play a really um, clear role in the current process, then I would, I think the default should be to remove it. Um, what I was going to say um, in relation to the question about MAG members participating, uh, I'm not sure it's exactly part of the discussion around this form. I think it, it yeah, it's a bit of a different thing. Um, but having thought about it and been involved in a lot of discussions since the last IGF, um, I do think that while it makes absolute, it makes sense for MAG members not to be speakers or moderators in workshop proposals, absolutely, um, because we determine, um, we, we assess the workshop proposals. I think it also makes sense that MAG members shouldn't be speakers in main sessions. But I do think there is a really strong logic to MAG members being moderators of the main sessions because it's the MAG that actually determines what those main sessions are going to focus on. We are the ones who understand, you know, where what discussion we had in mind when forming this. And we will presumably, as MAG members, be more predisposed to maintain our sort of objectivity in that role. But I think as a MAG member, sort of stepping into a moderation of a main session, that would absolutely feel, okay, no, I have to set my own views on this topic aside. I have to facilitate the conversation that's going on here. Um, so I don't, I don't think there is any conflict in that. And I actually think MAG members are, in some cases, maybe not all, better positioned to take that moderation role in a main session than others might be. But that's, I think, food for... I, I think we certainly need to get some clarity on that before moving forward. Chris, Bruno, Carol? I, I agree with uh, most of what Chris is saying, but it really should be a facilitating type role to move things along. And again, main session only if you are one of the organizers. I think it helps to move um, if you have somebody, because you've already met with your panelists and you've um, had discussions how things are going to flow. And if you realize that, hey, you're not really flowing or if somebody's hogging the space, you can try to jump in there and move things along. Thank you. No, just um, the same, following the same lines, I think beyond the main sessions, we also had a situation last year where one of the MAC members was a speaker at an NRI session. So we should be aware of the other types of sessions. So maybe our compromise could be um, maybe moderators for anything that's not the workshop process that we evaluate and everything else. But then we can also, try to, I mean, try to, to put a cap, like if we're doing one moderation or two moderation slots and, and that's all, no more than that, um, and try to like consider that because uh, I, I do see some value in if we're actually like steering the tracks as it's proposed right in this meeting, it might be, ha it might have indeed some value for us um, to moderate the main sessions, but we also want to bring in community and, and it's some sometimes we do have engagement in the, the track and in the main session organizing committee. Sometimes we don't and, and the views can be really different. So it's good to have at least this um this opportunity for us to step in as moderators for that one. Um but but let's consider the other options like BPFs, NRIs, and other things, just for us to, to achieve a, a consensus on that and, and what are we're we gonna do. So yeah. Thank you. 
<clears throat> there is already so a Mac member. Uh, this has always been an issue that has raised a lot of emotions. And I actually would like to argue that Mac uh, members should be allowed to speak or moderate sessions uh, because we do have a mechanism uh, to uh, avoid conflict of interest. And that the mechanism is that I'm not evaluating the proposal in which I may have been invited as a speaker or in my organizational uh, institutional capacity uh, have been tasked to put together a workshop proposal. Then uh, I think we should rely on all of us and our honesty that we will not get involved uh, in, in evaluating these and will uh, will say it very clearly. Um, other uh, reasons why I think this should be allowed, of course, to some proportion, uh, is that we are kind of the face, the kitchen of the IGF, yes, yeah? so we are involved, we are engaged, we want to help uh, maybe shape some sessions that we feel uh, belong uh, to the IGF. And then there are, of course, the practical reasons. Uh, uh, for some of us uh, not, not coming maybe from the global south, we have to justify expenses traveling to the IGF. And uh, I am aware uh, that for some organizations, it might be justified uh, to send a person to the IGF. And we all agree that as many MAC members as possible, I think, should be attending the IGF. And it's difficult to justify that. It is easier uh, to justify that uh, if you are a speaker uh, somewhere. And there has been so much ambiguity on this. Um, is it main sessions? Is it all sessions? Can I moderate? Can I step in last minute uh, if, uh, if the panel falls apart? Something that has been happening uh, on many occasions as well. Uh, does it relate to the fact where MAC members are called to rescue uh, to come to a session if nobody is available on site? Then they are uh, de facto moderators of that session as well. So I would actually argue, let's revisit this. Let's allow this to MAC members, but be super honest about conflict of interest. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jangatai, a large uh, MAC member. Um, actually, I'm of the view, I think I didn't mention this yesterday, I'm of the view that um, MAC members must not be speakers or moderators of workshops. Uh, because I remember last year during the evaluation, um, some of us actually have to kind of excuse ourselves in some of the topics because we were actually already um, the speakers in those in those you know workshops so we try to you know excuse ourselves uh, however i think in the main session i think it should be okay in the main session because these are the main um, uh, the main thematic areas i think we should be okay to do that um, however i also believe uh, maybe uh, like she said and the, as a last resort for example if you have issues in any particular workshop where the, the speakers are not around they're supposed to be you know here they are not there so maybe mark members can actually step in just to ensure that there is no failure in the in the in the, in the workshop itself that one, that one i can agree but as far as the other workshops are concerned i think we must try as much as possible to stay away um, uh, so that we can have neutrality in those workshops thank you thank you joyce thanks stringers hi joyce chin mac member um I'm very agnostic about whether Mac members can or cannot be speakers or moderators. Honestly, I, I, I think it's not really an issue in terms of conflict of interest. We've always been very good about, you know, saying out in advance if, you know, we happen to be named in a, in a workshop proposal for whatever reason, or if our institution has put in a proposal uh, and we step back and say we can't evaluate it. So I, I don't think this is the issue. I think from what I understand is a historical kind of culture or legacy that um, MAC members should try not to take the spotlight too much at the IGF. That was what someone else explained to me, like former, former, former MAC members. Um, I don't know if this is still how the MAC feels today. Like clearly there's a shift, um, you know, amongst the MAC that perhaps we don't have to be so strict about it. Um, we understand the Mac's role very clearly. I think it's okay if you know Mac members are being invited to speak on a certain topic because maybe they are a subject matter expert, and you know why not? I don't think the idea is really that Mac is going to hog the spotlight, so to speak. Um, for the main sessions, while I do agree with Chris that you know because we are involved in organizing the session, we understand the flow and the facilitation, the purpose and objective of the main sessions. I, I would say though, if possible, we should treat MAC members as a last resort. 
as and try our best first to find moderators. And when that fails, we shouldn't feel you know that we are unable to appoint ourselves, so to speak, to moderate those sessions. I don't think anybody should be shamed for being in the spotlight just because it was a last resort, right? So I, I'd really like for us not to shame one another, you know, if MAP members are in sessions, if, if it does happen, it's not like we are trying to put ourselves out there all the time. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Just for clarification, uh, MAC members can be in other sessions um, where there's not, because they're not involved in the creation of those sessions or the selection of those sessions, then they can be in the other sessions at the moment. Um, as it stands, yes, for more. and uh, just from the Secretariat's point of view, yes, of course, as a last resort to prevent the failure of a session, yes, the MAG member can step in. I think that should be self-evident. But the others, I will turn to the chair to make a calling on this soon, but we have Marcus, uh, Carol, and Justin. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Marcus Gomez speaking again providing a historical perspective very much in support of what Joyce has said. I think it was at one point it was felt that the MAG was essentially interested in putting themselves up front. And then maybe the MAG overreacted by saying, no, the MAG should not be seen in the main sessions. But I think as you put it, and as others said, uh, that I think sounds a very reasonable approach you know, obviously the mag should not be seen as self-grooming, but as being supportive of the event. And let's not be over prescriptive in the visibility or lack of visibility of mag members. Thank you, Carol. I, I think why I'm a proponent of mag members being part in the main session. Mm -hmm. um, facility. I have seen moderators take over a session and, well, not mag ones, and they just talk and talk and talk. And you can see the panelists like, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, we don't have any time because the moderator has taken, and I've sat in sessions like this, I'm saying, what? And so if you have a mag member in a main session that is keeping the flow, that, that's my view on having uh, such a moderator. Okay. And then lastly, Justin. Um, thank you. Yeah, I was just going to go to this point of uh, conflict of interest. I think that all of us are here probably representing, you know, probably our day jobs are working in, in other places that would make contributions. And we all kind of have come here in good faith and, um, you know, understand that we come from different places, but we're in the mag trying to uh, represent the interests of the IEGF as a whole. And, um, you know, so I think that having rigid rules on this is probably just not useful. Um, I think maybe some guidelines about avoiding conflict of interest, you know, deferring certain situations are more appropriate. But then, you know, leave it to the mag or the discussions or the, the organizers to determine what is helpful to lead a good discussion. If it gets abused, it could be revisited later. But I just, I think that rigid rules, when already we're talking about what, seven, eight different kinds of formats and different kinds of considerations that have to go into every proposal. And now there's virtual and in-person considerations. And now there's who can moderate, who can speak. And I, again, it just goes to, I think, just an overcomplication of the process and you know today we've had a good discussion and there's a reason behind all this and they're very valid concerns but i do think that at some point you have to kind of say okay we might not have a perfect system but it's going to be straightforward and understandable to new entrants new people you know to people that want to get involved with this that haven't been closely tracking it so okay uh thank you very much justin so i'll turn to the chair and the questions here are should MAG members be allowed to be on the first step um, moderators of last resort? And then the second step, uh, facilitators or moderators, and then top panelists as well. So there's different levels. Should we just do away with all the restrictions and trust in the MAG? Should we um, raise the bar because at the moment it's nothing at all? Or should we go to those levels? So, 
I think Justin spoke incredibly eloquently, uh, helped along with peace, and um, and I think the time is now <clears throat> to be able to relax those rules in favor of the better productivity, more flexibility, and exercising good judgment. We still have opportunity for recourse if the privilege is abused. Is there any, um, is that a consensus statement or is there any objections? No objections. Okay, so now it is open. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll just note that actually running an open thing is harder and riskier than running a closed one. So there's more flexibility but there's got to be more scrutiny too. So just keep that in mind. Okay, now, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think now it's Lito's turn to open a new topic. Oh, peace, you want to go ahead first? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chengitai. So I want to go back to uh, one thing that we brought up that I think should be discussed, the issue of anonymity of the organizers because usually they are not, when we do the evaluations, we don't know who they are, but we think it should be known. Thank you. Okay, so I'll just restate the question or the proposal is that we should remove the anonymity because when MAG members grade these workshops, they do not know who submitted the workshop at the current moment in time. Uh, this is so that we don't have any unconscious bias towards the person or organization that may seep in, um, either negative or positive, and we would just be grading on the merit of what we see in front of us. That was the idea behind it. So now the proposal is let's do away with that and let the mag see the full information while they're grading. So Elisa, you were first. And then I think Joyce was. Thank you, Chengatai. You know, I, I tend to feel that my eyes are just, uh, if I am, please tell me. It's okay, okay, yeah. Thank you, Chengatai. Um, well, um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so now everything goes um, for, well, MAC members being panelists or, um, or, or moderators. If the session proposals are an anonymized, um, that might be complicating things. So we'd have to look into how that would work. No, they are anonymized at the moment. When you so now yeah. the proposal is let's de anonymize them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay, but, but if it would stay as is, um, that might be complicating uh, the fact that everything goes. So, for for an hour consideration. Okay, Joyce. Thanks, Chengus. Hi, uh, Joyce Chen Mac member. Um. I would always be inclined to grade proposals based on anonymity. I feel that sometimes biasness can creep in. For example, when you see certain institutions or you know you know certain people, you might be inclined to want to you know give a little helping hand, <laughs> that sort of thing. So I, I think that there was a reason why it was anonymous to begin with, and I would be hesitant to drop that so quickly. Having said that, I'd like to understand a bit more in an evidence-based kind of approach. Have there really been instances of, you know, institutions submitting like five, six, seven proposals and getting through, um, you know, is there really such an instance? Um, in which case I think that de-anonymizing does make sense. Or could we not think of a better way to ensure that these institutions or people do not or are not able to keep submitting multiple proposals in the same year. 
I don't think it's possible for institutions to submit multiple proposals. There is a cap on um, the number of proposals an institution can submit. Am I correct, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then listen. Thank you. <laughs> I'm on the same page about the anonymity because I think um, last year to us at least, it became very clear on the maybe the second or third line of the proposal, who was writing that sometimes, like who was actually submitting some of the proposals because sometimes you know the language and, and that kind of like um, might have contributed to, to some bias at some point. So I would advocate for the anonymity um, in, in the workshop evaluation part because I think we need to evaluate content and that's mostly what we want, like looking at the, I mean, at this phase, at least, like we, I would be more leaning towards looking at content in a blind review kind of way, instead of like trying to, to, I don't know, tone down who is doing it or who isn't doing it um, from the very beginning. But um, to answer your question, I, I think it, it really does happen that the case that many organizations, they submit like four or five, six workshops and and I I was part of it. I was like I was asked for for to do that before. As in like sometimes it really happens that I don't know. It's um, Asia Pacific organization. I was telling you this um, during lunch that wants to to add diversity to the to the workshop submission. So they would invite a moderator from Latin America that would have nothing to do with the discussion. That does that that has nothing to do with the debate doesn't even know the organization so I understand it's like it's two different problems that we have to address but I would at least now um, continue to advocate <laughs> for the anonymity for for us to be able to analyze content first and then on a second phase maybe if we have doubts about whether this proposal should be approved or not or there is like some I don't know um, discrepancies or repetition maybe we could assess like who is the propos the actual proposal proposer of one session and, and so on. So yeah, just a, a thought about that. I do have an issue on um, if just, I mean, it doesn't happen now because we do have um, something to stop it happening that people do will not um, submit, you know, more than three workshop proposals. I think that's the number, um, um, but even if, people could submit five, what use would it be to know that these five, because how would you know which one to cut then? It seems, will you just stop? Oh, I've graded three. Okay, these four will not get in. And meanwhile, those, the last ones may be better than the ones that you've graded. So, but anyway, as I said, um, it doesn't happen. Each organization can only submit three um, workshop proposals, but listen. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Chigantai. Uh, well, the part of what I was uh, going to say has been covered by Bruno, so I'll be quick. Uh, coming from the uh, having a, a background also in academia, I see the merit of peer reviewing and uh, of anonymity. Uh, obviously, a few quirk uh, here and there, but uh, it's quite a good uh, point. And it's the appearance, obviously, of uh, of anonymity and so of independence, uh, you know, of the of the process, which is then transparent and is uh, a bit a way of evaluating altogether. So what I'm getting from this discussion is that there isn't a consensus that we should de-anonymize the um, grading process. So I don't think there's any, I think we should, it stays the way it is. Yes, yes. We continue to anonymize, we're not de-anonymizing. <laughs> right, it stays the way it, it has been. <laughs> okay, so Bruna, please. No, just to bring back Alyssa's point, she, she had a point. Uh, how do we know then? Um, I mean, are we just like making the same compromise that we're not going to submit sessions, us MAG members, um, just so we can, because the, the point was that, like, how can we avoid us being the, the proposers of sessions as well? Um, oh, you know, you still can't be proposers of the sessions. That wasn't, I know. we never <laughs> removed that. I <laughs> That mark, yeah, that's, let's just make that clear, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. Joyce. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks, Jacob. Sorry. Um, maybe you could explain again the why we are talking about perhaps uh, potentially de-anonymizing. What's the thinking behind that? Like, what is the problem actually we are trying to solve? Thank you, thank you, Jay. So. Uh, we had these discussions and we thought, okay, I think we cannot decide this. Let's take it to the to, to the to the wider mug. And we looked at it this way to avoid having the same, same people, like have the same organization or the same organizer, like have many more, many sessions and while the others don't. And then also we looked at it uh, that... Um, uh, Sometimes when we would we're, we're talking at that particular point, we're talking about the um, the newcomers, yes, the newcomers who don't really put the very the same measure of quality of proposal and and most times we then end up taking these people who have proposed many times who really know it, they know how to really put the best. So we thought if we know about it, then we could, you know, it, it's a good way to also have some of the new uh, comers uh, propose for sessions. Yeah, so, but I think uh, we are happy it's with what- my understanding that a person can only propose up to three. And also we do have an indication whether that person is a newcomer. So we know who the newcomers are and we know who, so I think, that's not a quite a valid argument for the de-anonymizing. <clears throat> Thank you, Chingitai. So I think we're happy because we, what we wanted to do is to bring it to the wider mug. So we're happy for these discussions. Yeah. Thank you. Um, if there's no objections, we will now go to Lito's new topic. If, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't know if this one, uh, the topic I'm about to to, to raise, uh, will bring such a discussion or not. I had I had to clarify first that this was not discussed within the working group as far in my brief time in it, but I had a little chat with uh, uh, Peace and Eleonora about the past, and we agreed that I could bring it up to see what the the wider mag thought about it. Oh, I mean the mag because, as I say, it was not discussed in the working group. My my topic is has to do with the uh, stakeholder list. I noticed academia was missing, and I could argue several uh, points about including them because uh, I think they they the academia won't uh, feel so much represented if they're that the stakeholder is not there. I, I understand this has been discussed previously, but I, as I said, I would like to bring it uh, back. Some of, uh, in some countries, internet has started in academia. Most or some of the research is done in academia. And uh, uh, if we, uh, some CCTLDs are in academia. And finally, the four, the first four institutions that were connected to the internet were universities. So I, I, I will argue that we should keep, I, I mean, include academia as a separate stakeholder and not to think they are included in the civil society. That's my, my point. I wanted to raise it. Thank you. No, thank you very much, Dita. Yes. Um... Historically speaking, yes, the internet did start um, all over the world, basically, mostly in academic institutions. Uh, when we did start, and Marcus can correct me here, that um, ac academia was included in the technical and academic uh, community. So that was one community. And then as the internet has developed, um, there has been a separation um, between the two. So um, the word academic has been removed because we know that there are some people in academia who are in the technical community because, you know, that's where there's a lot of community. But there are also people in the academia who are in the civil society um com community so it's so their academic is if you would say in a sense split between 
the technical community for those ones who are actually involved in the technical aspects and the hosting, et cetera, and the uh, civil society for the social, et cetera, um, research that goes on. Um, so the acad academia, as far as the IGF is concerned, was never a separate entity as such. And my personal opinion, not uh, my personal opinion, is that I think it would be also difficult to put them into one community now because they do um, straddle those uh, different um, groups. It may not be ideal, I know, yes, but yeah. <laughs> but of course, we're open to discussion, uh, Marcus. Yes, uh, you are absolutely correct. Let's, let's just uh, build on that, give the historical explanation. WISIS was set up as a, the original resolution calling for WISIS was set business, private, uh, private sector business, governments, and civil society. And the, there were academics in the civil society category, as Cheng and I said, but they were mainly from the social society, social sciences, historical or social scientists. Uh, I remember everybody knows Wolfgang Kleinecht to Milton Müller. These were sort of kind of academics. Then we had the discussions in the working group on internet governance. And then there were people coming from the internet institutions saying, hey, we don't belong there. You know, we are a separate category. We are usually not-for-profit organizations with running the internet. And some of them had academic background, but these are mainly the technical institutions. Uh, there were ICANN, there were the CCNSOs. And then coming into the next phase of WISIS, we sort of said it was necessary to recognize this, but the compromise was we called them academic and technical communities. And that was a subset of the uh, existing categories, but governments then did not want to introduce a new category. And that's where we come from with academic and technical communities. But over time, that was then, as Cheng and I said, said, okay, there is a technical community. These are the people involved in developing the internet and running the internet. I mean, people clearly like Windsurf, he has an academic background, but very much involved in running the internet. And that, it was never that clear cut, but mainly because in the second phase of uh, WISIS, governments were reluctant introducing a new category. And that was then as a su subcategory to the previous categories was academic and technical communities. But clearly the emphasis was, these are the internet guys developing and running the internet. I don't know whether I helped or whether I added to the confusion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, do we have any, Lito, please? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I can, I will not agree, but I can live with that. Uh, but I would like to ask that uh, at some point we revisit this, this issue, if not now, because I strongly believe that uh, just like the internet has evolved and has covered many uh, aspects of our lives, for instance, speaking about research in universities, in academia, they have research for human rights, sociology, psychology, that is not technical in the pure sense of a technical community, uh, if you see what I mean. I mean, technical community we understand here, the community that is, relates to uh, internet or digital uh, applications or so on, like ICANN, uh, ISO, like me, et cetera. And uh, academia is wider than that uh, in, in topics. So uh, they, they teach, they um, educate the new generations, they speak about laws, they speak about uh, uh, innovation and so on. So I would, I would argue that uh, we should have a, a separate uh, stakeholder name for them. But as I said, I won't be arguing more. I, 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 I take what the group uh, uh, decides, but maybe at some point in the future, we can revisit it. 
So that will be fine for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Christine, please. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would like to support Lito because I think that the, um, the philosophy of having different stakeholder groups at the time, and Marcus, maybe you can correct me, it was about the different roles uh, that those stakeholder groups play in, in terms of internet governance. And it was that governments play a role versus that um, civil society, private sector, and technical community, they play different roles. And here I can see that what Lito is bringing into the table is that academia, they do provide a different role when we talk about academic institutions where they provide research. Um, so, so I would like really to support that this is something that should be looked at and maybe at a later time, if not, if not soon, but I mean, at some point in time, this is something that should be addressed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Christine. Uh, do you have any other interventions or thoughts on this matter? Yes, Joyce. Thanks, Chengatai. Joyce Chen, Mac member. I also support um, having a separate category for academia. I think they do play quite a different function now in all the various different communities. So it does make sense for them to have a separate category for which they can identify themselves if they so wish to. Having said that, I think perhaps maybe some homework needs to be done if this proposal is even feasible in the UN system, et cetera, et cetera, if this you know, portal or the system allows it. But I think if there is nothing wrong with having it legally or politically speaking, I would very much agree to supporting this. Thanks. In fact, that was um, part of my thought process. <laughs> just now I said, okay, I mean, is it even feasible? Who has the power? Can the MAC just say, let's have a new category and we have a new category? Do we have to go to New York? Do we have to, uh, I mean, is it be between now and the Tunis agenda, which way does it go? And then also the other thing is that when we start creating new categories, is that a good thing? Will we create other categories? There's a strong call for a youth category, et cetera. So, this can have a roll-on effect. So we should also not think about it in that, uh, in this specific instance, but also in the larger uh, picture as well. But yes, um, we have noted that. Yes, please. This is Alan Ramirez, MAC member. I want to support uh, Lito's proposal. Actually, uh, for example, ITU has two different subsets one is company slash organization and the other one is academia. So I understand this is the United Nations system uh, and works uh, very well. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I'll just give that homework to Wyman to see what um, what is feasible and what is not feasible. And if we do anything, at least we know what roads we have to take, but um, I'm, I'm not saying anything. We just, you know, uh, putting out feelers to see what it is and not saying that we are going to even go down the road, but we're just putting out feelers. Thanks, Chengadan. Um, that's uh, Wai Ming Kuok. I'd like to take up Joyce's suggestion that you'll be homework for us. Uh, but I must say, yes, um, IGF is uh, part of the UN process, being uh, the Secretary General as the convener, and we have that uh, legal clarity that the IGF is a UN process. So having said that, it will be different from other groups, including ITU as a specialized agency. And this, this is a particularly uh, um, has been also discussed in other forums. In UN context now, there are like uh, what we call major groups um, that are non-member state. And this include like women, children and youth, indigenous, local authorities, trade unions. So if we go around the line that to have a new group, we may end up in... Um, if I can say in, in a in, in a bigger issue than what we like to so please groups. maybe take it there's a homework for us and we'll get back. Thank you. Yes, Marcus. Well, one other opportunity would be to revisit it in the WISIS plus 20 process as the definitions we have taken in the IGF context were taken from WISIS. And Again, uh, you know, civil society was very strongly uh, marked by academia in the WISIS process. There were lots of academics involved. They fell under the civil society group. But uh, again, 
this is something we might consider bringing up also in the business plus ten team process. Okay, thank you. And Chris, um, I, I think Lido's suggestion and proposal makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm wondering. I mean, this workshop proposal form is not. I, I wonder if it reaches the status of a very formal UN document, or whether we can play with it a little. Because I think what we're really just looking for here is to make it a little bit more inviting to people from all all backgrounds and all all positions, um, and I guess to give ourselves as the mag a little bit more of a sense um, of the diversity that we're getting. Um, I'm not sure where looking to do anything more substantive to the WISIS process at this point. I, I take the point that we might be opening a can of worms, but I mean, WISIS plus 20 is going to be a big can of worms opened anyway. So I'm not sure that's something we can. No, avoid. I mean, if Lito's question is solely for the workshop proposal form, that's a different issue. He didn't preface his thing with, for the workshop proposal form, I would like to have academia as a category that's a different kind of uh talk yeah mm -hmm. yes please mm -hmm. joyce chen mac member um is it though just i mean even if it's just a form but the fact that there might be roll-on effects you know because the secretariat has to report on the diversity of the categories etc and then again I preface this by saying that I do support having academia as a separate category, but I, I do commiserate with, with the Secretariat that there might be other roll-on effects that we're not quite thinking of at the moment, just because this might be an easy or convenient kind of situation we're in. Not, I don't want to put words in your mouth, obviously, but I think we, we could be a bit more careful about this. Well... You know, I'm from the Burn It Down camp. <laughs> but no, I mean, I look, I I, I take that point and I'm, I, I'm not sort of for throwing all caution to the wind. But uh, I mean, I, I think there is a discrepancy here in that we have a form that doesn't actually include academia on it. And I think from, I don't know whether it's explicitly written in Wissus and Tunis, and I, Mark, this was Marcus's point before, but I mean, technical and academia were kind of joined together academia is now not mentioned on this. And I think that's an absence that we as the MAG really should take take some notice of and, and take some action to resolve because we certainly don't want to um, make academic stakeholders feel that they don't have a place in the IGF. And I think that's the danger that we have with the form as currently written. Um, yeah, I mean, as I say, they, they, they're absolutely maybe ramifications that I'm not thinking through and if, if we yeah I, I just I'm, I'm also hesitant to say we should throw this to a longer process where um because I think it really be mean, good to sort of resolve this today and get the form signed yeah, down we need this form signed quickly um everything you do there's going to be some sort of a ramification I mean that's a given so if we want to, okay, maybe not a separate category of youth of um, academia, but you know, um, civil society dash academia, and then I don't know if it will work, but I have to consult. Yeah, <laughs> the easy solution, as always, is use agreed language, and that's academic and technical community. And that leaves it open. But, but then that lumps in academic and technical community. Yes, what my it, the ask is that academia should be a separate community as such, especially in the form of the workshop proposals, which is actually not a bad suggestion. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but okay, we'll, we'll consult and discuss, and then we'll we'll come back to you on that one. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Chris. Just, just, just to say that if we do not get to a state where we can actually put academia because of whatever ramifications there are there, at least the minimum of the minimum is to put in the agreed language so that they yeah. they feel they're there irrespective of how they're there. No, I, I don't think it's, I mean, this is my understanding. It's not the agreed language because as I said, with the technical and academic community, then you'll lump them with the technical and academic community. 
it's not about language. It's about that we should have some workshop proposals that we can identify as being from academia. So the language is not actually the, the issue here. It's that they want to be able to have workshop proposals from academia and be identified as being from academia. And then we have to see how we can accomplish that within the framework of what we have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if we don't have any, we've got half an hour to go, well, 45, 44 minutes to go. We don't have to go through all those 44 minutes, but um, so my, I will restate my question to Peace is that, do you want to call to now for the workshop form to be approved? Or do you want to, I mean, there's three ways we can go about it. Call now for the workshop form to be approved. Call now for a conditional approval of the workshop form that the workshop form is approved if A, B, and C is going to be fixed. Or do you want to go away and then report in a week with the um, suggestions that have been made, especially about the session types, et cetera, um, and any other comments that you may have. Thank you, Chingitai. I think I would uh, say we take the conditional. Conditional, did you say that? Is that the word? Yes. Let's say conditional. That's if everybody approves, of course, if the MAG is um, happy with that. Yes. I would request for that. <laughs> Joyce. Um, Joyce Chen, Mac member, I, I think I should throw this back away and stop taking the mic. But um, the, I think we haven't resolved um, the, the section on how many people we're expecting at minimum to be on site. So currently the form still says minimum of 50% of the speakers have to be on site. And we had this discussion at the previous, the virtual meeting. But because the language still stays the same, I'm not sure if this is what the MAG has then agreed that we are going forward with it. How so, many, um, um, which section is it? I don't, there is no page number, uh, but, <laughs> but it's highlighted in yellow. Yes. Yeah. Um, Speakers, is it number eight? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the concern that 50% is too much, is too little? Is um, uh, What's the argument? Mm -hmm. Yes, Chris. So right now there's a bit of a discrepancy in that in the speaker section, we left it as saying at least half the speakers, including, no, hang on, is that, is that section eight? Um, well, in the in the sort of introductory text, we said um, the MAG now requires that at least a moderator and some of the speakers should be on site in Kyoto. Um, section eight still says um, a minimum of fifty percent of speakers should be present on site at the IGF, and that I'm not sure what the other part that Eleonora had had up before, which just says half. Um, yeah, that's and then under under section four, ensuring implementation of a hybrid session, it says at least half the speakers, including a moderator facilitator, should be confirmed as being able to attend in person. So we have three slightly different um, formulations there, which probably would be good to rationalize. Uh, Peace. The most I'm hearing is fifty percent, fifty percent, fifty percent, and then there's three, right? Yeah, one says at least the moderator and some speakers. One says at least half, uh, at least the moderator and half the speakers. Mm. And then in the speakers, it says 50%. Is there a quick way? Was it just a matter of not updating all the sections or is it yeah. still in the open? Okay, so thank you. Uh, the, the whole idea is to emphasize the need for some speakers and uh, a facilitator being on site. So um, saying 50% could be a little bit harsh, but we need to have 
you know, the organizers respecting that, that they need to have a speaker, some speakers and moderators there. So that's why we brought in the issue of saying 50%. So we could... Yeah, I think we should either say, I think we should give a number, we should say 50% or we should yeah. say I think an, uh, three or, but yeah, some is very ambiguous, yeah. Thanks, Joyce Chun, that member. So from the virtual meeting, um, actually what we had discussed and potentially was instead of 50% or half of whatever permutation of people on site, we would have we would have language that just says um, at least one speaker would be on site rather than 50%. Um, not because we're, we're not encouraging people to think of it in a hybrid way, way, but just because there might be people who find it very difficult to travel, cannot get the funding or support, um, and we don't want to discourage um, session organizers from running the session just because people cannot afford to go. Um, of course, we will help where we can, um, but yes, anyway, up for discussion with everyone, thanks. Okay, to me, one is less than some, but <laughs> <laughs> Bruna, please. Yeah, I was just going to go on the same lines. It's, it, sometimes it, maybe it's better for us to consider like at least two or at least three speakers on site instead of this 50% kind of thing, because it might be hard to 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 like divide it out. But in the end of the day, it's the same issue. Like I, I like my community in Latin America is going to be super expensive to travel to Japan. Other than that, there's also the time zone issue. And um, also considering that we're going to Kyoto in a rather touristic time of the year. So it's it's it, it might we might be a little bit considerate with regards to like people actually not having the funds to go. So at least three, it's kind of a good compromise with a part of the session on site still having people and a proper discussion and also bearing in mind um, the ones that cannot travel. So I will be supportive of that. Yes, please. Yes, thank you. Um, I would uh, go for actually at least two. Um, uh, you know, and then there's another one that we have not discussed yet about the issue about policy. Um, in the in the form the yeah. policy. Yeah. So I think we need to uh, left to me alone. I think we can remove that one. You know. Okay. Let's. Not, um, no. I'll I'll come back to you. Um, let's just see if we can close this. Uh, Marit. Yes. Um. So I, I feel that uh, we should have at least the moderator on site and maybe then 50%. Uh, I was attending some sessions in uh, Ethiopia where the moderator was uh, not on site. And I felt that there was a lot of commotion before even getting the session started because simply the main uh, coordinator wasn't on site. So it would be good to mention the moderator uh, separately. And then whether that's 50% or two speakers or three speakers more, uh, I think that's for discussion. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Matt. Yes, Chris. I kind of agree. A moderator and at least two speakers on site. Going once, going twice. I can live with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm sorry, Chris. I just got the evil eye from him. Um, <laughs> nothing breaks my heart more than walking into an IGF workshop and seeing five or six people up on a dais. So when you start putting numbers as opposed to percentages, you're forcing people to have large panels. If you start putting, so you're, wait, wait, uh, sorry. Numbers are better. If you, no, percentages are better. Percentages are better. Because if you say, you know, uh, a, a moderator plus two speakers, well, maybe I've got that backwards. Yes, that's what I thought. Yes. <laughs> I rescind my previous intervention. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I have two, three, and 50. 50%, uh, sorry. Um, before I give it back to peace. Um, yeah. If you want to compromise, let's go with three, but peace. <laughs> Thank you. So I think we take two speakers, at least two speakers and a moderator, because a moderator is very, very important. How will how will the online moderator know that there's a hand up and you know it's it's we need to have a moderator uh, on site. Thank you.
Okay. Um, I'm not ashamed of saying it, but my personal opinion is three, but yes, okay. <laughs> uh so chair yes uh it seems like two and the moderator but yeah um. i like three and the moderator and, and, the, and the moderator three, no, three, Three and a moderator. Okay. I mean, again, uh, um, my ears are open. Is that okay? With the moderator. Yes, Lisa. Uh, just, just to clarify, uh, well, for the moderator part, we have an on-site moderator anyway, uh, I guess, which obviously should be present. I mean, in the form when you you actually declare it, you have the on-site and the the remote uh, moderator. But you, I take the point. Obviously, three people minimum on-site, three speakers could be a lot for a I guess a, a panel with four speakers. That mean okay, four. Yeah. You know, it's uh, right. Yes, just say the moderator, three including the moderator. Yes. Clear. Um, I think um, what's important is that we have at least one person there that can answer the questions of the audience. So when Peace and I stood in as a moderator for one of the sessions, um, afterwards people came and asked us questions. We didn't know what they were talking about. We were just there to help, <laughs> right? And because and it was a good thing that we were there because the session would not have happened. Sure because nobody was there to be able to coordinate between an all online panel and moderators and the technical person. So to me, you need at least one, the moderator, an on-site moderator and one speaker that will be able to handle. Anything above that is, is, is gravy. Okay. I'm a computer person. So we'll compromise and let's just say, anyways, it's not a, it's not a compromise. I mean, it's it's rather clear. Let's do for two, uh, two plus the moderator because you always need a backup. Actually, you know, if you say um, at least two, if you have three or four, it's still fine. Yeah. So if you have at least two, the moderator plus another person, at least. So it means that's a minimum. So you can get three or four, you know. Okay. But I think it'll be fine, yeah. Karina Irarda, MAG member. Um, in my opinion, the moderator and two panelists is great number. Okay, thank you. Okay, so agree, two plus one. Yep. All, all in favor, right? Two plus one. Yeah. At least. Yes, that's the minimum. Okay, so. Yes, Alison. Okay, so <laughs> I'm, I'm fully happy with this, but um, once we're getting uh, closer towards Tokyo, uh, sorry, Kyoto, um, we're seeing, or at least there's a possibility of people dropping out as being a speaker um will if so if if this the 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 organizer won't be able to manage the amount of people on site will the session be cut yes Bruno. just it's a fair question because that's what led us to the situation that Carol just described. We had full sessions online. We stepped in as moderators. We didn't even know how to answer the questions. I was also in one of those situations. So might be good to maybe like establish a deadline. So if by let's say end of August, we don't have like a full confirmation of at least two moderators, oh, two, two speakers and one moderator, then maybe we could consider either asking for them to invite new speakers or anyone that would be able to be present 
or um, we might drop the session. I don't know. Yes, I think. Okay, yes, I think that's good. If they don't do it, then let's drop the session and see if we can, because we always have a waiting list. And I think if so much resources are being put into a meeting, we should use that venue. And again, uh, that usage statistic should remain as close to 100% as possible. So yeah, so then we just drop them and put in another session that can have uh, people in. Hmm. I, so I piece did have that thing about the conditional um, acceptance of the form. Do we have anybody, any comments on a conditional acceptance of the form now that they'll fix the issues that they've noted down? And then we just, as um, conditional, we have it accepted. Yes. Sir. Just to be clear, what would be deadline day? Or will we still decide? Um, can we put up the um, the timeline? <laughs> Thanks, Chengatai. While we're waiting for the timeline to be up, just on the point of um, sometime in August or at some point in the in the working timeline, if speakers somehow drop off from a session and they don't have enough people on site to run a session, um, then we bump up a session that is in the waiting list to replace that session. Um, I've lost my train of thought because there were so many sessions. <laughs> I'll come back to you. Uh, no, yeah, that's problem. No problem. You can, uh, why don't you just keep it there? Yes, uh, just come back. Um, so according to um, our timeline that we have the... Um, Call for sessions on the 1st of April. So everything has to be ready by the 1st of April. Uh, Lewis needs the form in good time so that he can program it and also do the testing. Um, so I, I would like just to give you a week until next week. I remember my thought. Can I yes, just say please. it before I forget it? If that is the case, and if the MAG is deciding because we are going into hybrid mode and we will not accept remote-only sessions at the IGF itself, it has to be made clear in the form when they're submitting, we will not accept any remote-only sessions so that we don't end up with a situation where people do not declare that their speakers have dropped and they continue to run a remote session anyway. It wouldn't be fair. So if this is going to be a condition that we have, we should inform session proposers before they submit the proposal that this is the expectation. Uh, Peace will make sure that that is in the form. And um, when Lewis does program it, he'll make sure that it is also highlighted. Yes, Alice. Um, I'm fully- Lisa, sorry, Lisa. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, I'm fully aware that we only get to decide upon the, the 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 main the workshops and the main sessions, but um, will this also be a criteria for open forums, lightning talks, and the full list? That I, I would think so. Okay. Yes, okay. I mean it's the same concept that yeah. uh, we have. You know people there we have an infrastructure yeah. there we should use it otherwise we don't need that if it's remote so yeah. yes it should be utilized okay so just to be fully clear on that perfect while the timeline is up is there any um comments 
on the timeline as such. Um, I know you, it's been comp uh, it's been approved or anything, but has anything new come up uh, just to be certain that. Mm. And the one, uh, the other thing, but this is for tomorrow, is that we do have to think about the um, open consultations, uh, the second open consultations in my meeting. I just found out that um, the dates that we had proposed is actually a, it's, is, it, is it EDOs, something that falls? It, so we can't really have that. Uh, what is it? It is Eid al Adha. Yeah, yeah. So we really can't do, do that because I'm sure we wouldn't appreciate it if it falls into one of ours. So um, we will have to shift a little bit, um, not too much, but we have to shift a little bit um, those dates. Mm -hmm. So um, at the moment, we had that the second open consultations would have been uh, 28 to 30th of June. And it uh, falls on which date? 29th. So, so no. Um, and we can't have it the week after because that would be um, uh, 4th of July. <laughs> uh, so maybe one option is have it the week. I will just note that, that it was last year it was on July 4th as well. So, so Yeah, so we can't keep on doing that. So uh, we can either have it the week before you're a dig. Yeah, so um, yeah, we have to think about something. Pardon? We can have it the week of 10 July. It's getting a little bit close to, but yeah, we can have it the week of 10 July if that is what is uh, most, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna put in a plug for the Bahamas, but that's when the Bahamas turns 50. <laughs> <laughs> and we can have a uh, celebration. I don't know, I mean, please, I have no idea what relevance it does. Oh, no, just throwing it in. Oh, okay. Right there. okay. <laughs> That's just for you to think about. I'm just giving you some stuff to think about for tomorrow. Yes, uh, just. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's <laughs> that the top interveners, you know, is Chris, Joyce, and then you. So I, Destin is a bit behind. So <laughs> I, I would just um, note, I think the week after July 4th, uh, whatever week that is, is the I2 Council. Um, in Geneva. So I think that that, you know, little scheduling um, issue uh, maybe not affects everybody here, but it does make actually present maybe an opportunity where there will be, you know, kind of a broader group of folks interested in issues of the, of the IGF. And so the open consultation could be a little bit more um, in inclusive and, and uh, of, of that community of, um, you know, ministers of telecommunication, things of that nature. Just a, they'll be busy with other things, I'm sure, but uh, it might present an opportunity. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, yes, Bruno. Thank you. And I'm fully aware that I'm speaking a lot as well. So it's it's not that I don't know. It's... Oh, no, no it's a, it, it is appreciated. Um, I'm oh, not, it's, uh, okay. it's, it's not a criticism at all. <laughs> Just about the dates um, for this, the, the second MAG meeting is um, the, the same thing. June is a very busy month. It starts with um, RightsCon and then goes into erodic i can a lot of things and and we did we do want to avoid this conflict that we had this time with i can at least a little bit um and but but my comment was more about us maybe starting to work on the main sessions together with the second mag meeting because we don't want to work on them on just like one month ahead of the the igf like we did last year we kind of sure. went better timeline so yeah Oh, sorry. Do we have for today any other topic we want to speak about this afternoon? Is 
the last time. It doesn't have to be today, just for us to try to reach a, a consensus on how are we approaching the gender discussion for this IGF. There is the proposal for a uh, town hall or something like that. We unfortunately didn't have a, um, a proposal for the BPF gender, but where else and, and how else can we work this agenda would be interesting to discuss. I mean, either tomorrow for 20 minutes or something like that, but I really wouldn't like us to leave this meeting without having some more ideas on how to, to bring it, this into okay, Thank you very much for that um, reminder. Yes, uh, we have to do that and we can do it tomorrow. But we also agree that in the workshop proposal form, we are going to state um, the importance of gender inclusion, right? Um, but it is there in the workshop form, right? 50-50, I'm sure it's there um, somewhere. Mm. Justin. Um, thank you, and I don't want to keep anybody longer, but I know I know I do know some folks have to leave tomorrow because of ICANN and other obligations, and unfortunately, I'm I'm one of them. I, I am very interested in the WSIS and the GDC discussions. I don't know if it's possible just to like give two minutes of, of thinking uh, to inform the group, since I won't be able to participate. But I don't want to, you know, step on your agenda here. Want us to start thinking about it now? Well, I would just like to. Well, I would like to um, just say, you know, a few short words on on our thinking. Oh yeah, yeah, but, yes, but yes, also yes, yes, go ahead, welcome go ahead. others yes. if if they're not. But also, if others aren't able to be here tomorrow and and won't be on record in the transcript, others if they have anything. But I I would just say, you know, I think it's it's obvious through the discussion we've had so far this week. Um, and really no surprise that the, the GDC is, is very much of interest to kind of the global community. And I think there's a lot of uncertainty around what it is or what it will be, but some of that's coming into focus. And, you know, there's often these different kind of processes that are playing out. But, but, but I think there was a unique kind of ask request of the IGF uh, to be very involved in that process and help support that process. They're, they're mentioned next to each other in our common agenda. Uh, during the the consultations that were held earlier, you know, about a month ago in New York, there was clear calls by the stakeholder community to leverage the IGF, to use the IGF, to include the IGF uh, in those discussions. And I, you know, I think there is some concern that um, many of our colleagues who work in New York do a lot of good work, but they're not really tech experts. They, you know, they go from human rights meetings to development meetings to non-proliferation meetings. <laughs> And so uh, they cover a lot of ground, but 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 the ambition of a global digital compact uh, is a lot for folks that don't you know kind of live and breathe this stuff every day. And again, I think that's where the IGF can come in and really offer a very uh, valuable resource. Um, similar thing to WSIS, I think there's a little bit of WSIS is a little bit further out, but clearly the IGF has an interest in WSIS. It's, that's where the IGF's mandate came from, uh, and there'll be a discussion of the IGF and other topics um, there. My suggestion would just be, and, and it's no surprise, I think we've already discussed it in various ways, is to really look at the roadmap that, that came out from the co-facilitators and see you know, how the IGF fits into that. And, and frankly, the IGF is multi-stakeholders bottom up, but it's a UN process. Uh, and it's, it's a collaborative effort of a lot of UN entities. And I think that it really belongs in that roadmap to, um, um, you know, there's this, deep dive consultations that are happening in New York around a lot of the same discussions that we're having in the IGF processes. And then there'll be issues, papers, and a policy brief coming out um, for this SDG ministerial in September. And then it seems to be a gap before a negotiation process kicks off in very late of this year or early next year. And that's right when the IGF is happening in Kyoto. And so I think it really tees up the IGF to be uh, an opportunity to elaborate, to check, to provide feedback, to engage. Great that the co-facilitators are coming. Hopefully, you know, uh, others are coming. Maybe we can encourage colleagues that are in New York to come to Kyoto, even though it is during the UNGA. Um, but I just think that, you know, not just having people go into different meetings, but actually integrating IGF into the process in an appropriate way uh, would be, um, you know, very helpful. Um, at the same time, I think the MAG, as we develop the program, to just kind of consider those conversations that are going in New York and the degree that we can align our work. Uh, I think we should remain independent and we should, you know, focus on kind of a broader aperture 
uh, uh, policy discussions, but to the degree we can align our work and help support that in the work of the IGF, I think we have somewhat of an obligation to do that, but also an opportunity uh, to that. So I would en encourage the MAG to, to consider that. Anyways, I do apologize. I won't be here tomorrow, um, but I, I wanted to kind of provide you know, that thinking. Thank you. No, thank you very much, Justin, and thank you very much for that intervention. Um, I don't know if people have, uh, if somebody wants to add, or yes, Chris. Okay. Sorry, this is, and this is really not something to discuss today, but I just wanted to clarify for tomorrow. Um, we, we had some discussion, obviously, with the leadership panel about um, uh, liaison to their different groups, and I was wondering, are we thinking that's something that the MAG can discuss, and maybe identify uh, people who could take up those roles um, during this meeting, so tomorrow, or is that something we'll, I, I think it's something it would be good to get in place sooner rather than later, um, mm -hmm. so perhaps something for us to think about. Um, and there was also just uh, in perhaps something of the same um, space, there was some discussion on the recent working group strategy call um, about the youth engagement in the IGF and possibly a youth um, requirement or of youth seats on the on the mag um, now i'm not sure what the steps for the mag would be in relation to that perhaps a communication to dessa or something saying we think this is we, we have heard from our communities and we've had if that's what the mag feels um we think this would be appropriate i guess that would be the sort of um action that I could see. Yeah, my, taking. my question is, do we? <laughs> well, no, no, yeah, no. And, that's, we, and, we, and we still need that, that discussion. But I, but it, if we're having that discussion, it makes sense to have a, in mind where we might be moving towards. Um, um, if, if the MAG can't do anything in this regard at all, then we don't need to have the discussion. But I, I would hope the MAG could do something, if only to sort of express um, its consensus opinion, if that consensus opinion exists. I think Peace wants to say something. Sorry, Chengita, I'm taking us back a little bit. We talked about having uh, the second open consultation after 10 something. And then we also talked about having um, um, uh, putting it clear that by August, uh, the proposals should confirm, you know, their, their presence online and on, on, on site, I mean. So if we are meeting around the time and then, you know, selecting the, 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 um, the workshops and then informing them that might run until, I don't know, end of July. And so just thinking about this timeline, quite tricky. Thank you. Uh, do you have a proposal? I don't really have a proposal because the meeting, the second uh, open consultation, you know, we we have all these other events happening prior to that. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know what we can do, but we um, need to have it in mind that, okay, if we're meeting around 10th or something that week, uh, July, August is just... I mean, we can away. push back the confirmation date uh, to suit it. Then, it, of course, it will go closer to the uh, meeting, but... Okay. I think that's the only reasonable thing that we can do uh, unless we are going to have a meeting that is going to be um, in parallel with another meeting, which we don't want. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and of course, we can always hold an online meeting, but that's also not that conducive to discussion. Mm. Okay. I think we'll explore that more. Uh, something we ability. can think of overnight as well, because we're yeah. going to make the final decision tomorrow afternoon in any case. So yes. that's something that we can all think about and all reflect on. And with that, this, oh. Um, thanks, uh, Mac Chai. And what I mean, well, you and Dessa. I just have to react to Justin since you will be not here tomorrow. I think what you mentioned is a very valid point. And also, Jorge, 
also uh, reiterate the same, and I'm sure many of you um, has um, you know shared the same about the connecting to GDC substance wise and also to the work of the tech envoy, um, not just GDC but overall digital cooperation. So um, I will actually take back this message to link with the office of the tech envoy. Um, as you know, there's also the staff changeover at Tech Envoy office. Some of you, many of you know Yu Ping Chan and Jason Monia. Uh, we have new, there are new colleagues there. So we will reach out to them and uh, we will do as, as, as best. But I think it's actually quite clear that we will need to work um, closer with them towards the GDC as well as Summit of the Future and then the, the, the linkages which all of you agree. So I'm just trying to say here, that uh, we will follow up. Um, the subject of whether uh, specialists in New York versus Geneva, uh, I will not comment further because all countries are different. Um, it's not necessary that's the subject experts for, for some member states who will only be in Geneva and not in New York. So it, it, it's all different as, as far as the GA is concerned because it's in New York, not that it's New York, New York, but that is <laughs> where the GA is. Thank you. Back to you, Chen. Thank you. Before we close, does anybody have any last business for today? If not, then we're adjourned until tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock.